Hey, my man. How's it going? Hello. I'm good. Thanks. How are you doing? All good. All good. Let's wait on Tosha and then it's the two. And then we can basically just do a quick run through for the recordings. Outside of that, everything else is set up except Facebook, but that will do five minutes early. Perfect. Perfect. Sounds great. By the way, I like the beard. <laughs> if you can call it a beard, but <laughs> thank you. Are you growing a beard in general or just the lower part? No, it's just I cannot shave properly with just one hand. Ah. <laughs> so just kept it. Mm. Hey, Danisa. Uh, I see someone else is connecting. Mari Ange. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mari uh, she Ange. will be one of the panelists. And mm -hmm. But yeah, we're at the moment in practice session just so actually we can set up everything. Then five to 10 minutes early, we will go public. Pretty okay, much okay. use this time to set up. Hey, Danica. Hello, hi. Ciao, Staima. <laughs> By the way, is it that chilly in Mostar? Or... Yeah, I mean, not today. Uh, I, I made a mistake and brought a very, very thick jacket today because yesterday it was freezing cold. <laughs> today it's fine. Yeah. So we're back into the summer mode, hopefully. Yeah. We had one day of um, autumn and now it's spectacular. Mm, yeah, here it's 9 degrees and it's raining. Oh, goodness. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Are you in Belgrade? Yeah. Cool. But yeah, tomorrow it should be better in terms of weather. At least the rain should stop. So, so that... Uh, but by the way, now that you said inshallah and with that beard, you, you remind me uh, a bit of that guy who is in Khabib's group. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that exactly, but uh, yeah, there are some blonde Chechens. <laughs> By the way, Klim, how's your hand since we're talking about Kabib? I mean, arm. Yeah, it's fine. It's, uh, it doesn't hurt anymore. It's just uh, very uncomfortable to do basically anything. <laughs> but... uh, sorry. sorry, one second. Natasha? No, I just took this one. I 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 took this one. Yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, Tosha asked me something about the setup, so uh, what did you say? I'm sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> no, I said uh, that uh, it's just uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it doesn't hurt, so it's fine. Just need to wait one more week and then they will change uh, the cast. Uh -huh, and then you're back in fighting shape again. Hopefully, <laughs> hope so. but I'll still we'll have to wear another one for two weeks. Oh, goodness. But but I, yeah, go ahead. Then. Uh, I'm sorry, Tosha is calling me. I have to go help him set up. No problem, no problem. Yeah, yeah. I'll be back. I'm sorry. Uh, Take but, your time. But by the way, did you get any better in terms of typing with your left hand? Uh, yes, kind of, but I still uh, keep dictating and annoying everyone around me. <laughs> everyone thinks I'm talking to them and then they realize I'm actually <laughs> talking to my laptop so, yeah. uh, by the way I think Marie Paul is with us can you hear us hello 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 Ple pleasure to have you uh, pleasure to see you two, back two of you. okay so See. I don't know if, if it's the same for you, Marco, but it uh, seems like we have two uh, mm. Maries. Yes, yes, yes. I have uh, my second my second device. Ah, okay. okay, okay. The first one I'm going to rename myself, but not on the second one. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> no problem. Uh, well, one thing that we'll do basically once the old all the interpreter team is in. I'm going to assign you to the particular channels and then we can do a quick test once again, just to see if everything yeah. is running smoothly. Okay. 
Ah, yes. Okay. Okay. No, no. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. <laughs> uh, shall I set up a French English channel for you so we can do a quick test? Yes, yes if, if you, you want. want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Just give me a moment. I'll be right back. This one. Okay. Okay, so I signed you to, shall we check the English, French channel? I'm on the French one now. Can okay. you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, okay. I switch over. I switch over to the English one? Yes, I'm in the English one now. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we sorted out one interpretation channel. We're sort out perfect. more. I'll be taking the uh, Russian interpretation, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, once we set up all the channels, pretty much I'll stop this recording. You start recording, you, Danica, and Tosha, and then we go basically uh, pretty much. I'll, I actually already, I allowed you to record local files, so mm -hmm. you can actually record already. Okay. I'll allow the same for Danica and Tosha once he logs in. Okay, I'll start recording when a Russian interpreter joins and I'll just uh, switch to Russian channel and stay yeah. there all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. And you can work in the background or do whatever, yeah. Okay, so I don't have to keep this uh, screen open. Yeah, yeah. That and uh, turn your video off. Just uh, leave, uh, leave the mic on, turn the video off just so it doesn't <laughs> capture any sounds. Yeah. So uh, mic and video off. Not, not yet done, it's just um, telling Klim at, at the moment, pretty much the procedure once we start the recording, mm -hmm. uh, you are allowed to record. So you can, you select your channel, you go under the interpretation, you select your own the French channel, right? Or Spanish. Uh, I'm not sure. I think Tosha said French, uh, Spanish for me. Let okay. Me check once again. Okay. And pretty much you go to the Spanish channel once we establish it, and then you start recording. Mm -hmm. All right. Right, I don't know if you guys are uh, watching Telegram, uh, but the PC in the office that Tosha is on doesn't have a camera. Yeah, yeah, that's not, that's not a problem, basically. The main thing is his mic is working, so he can okay. actually. So I'm on Spanish, he's French, Klim Russian, and uh, you are English. And I'm um, the, the English channel, yeah. Mr. Worldwide. <laughs> <laughs>
Once we start recording, of course, our cameras and our mics are going to be off. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. I'm actually not Bart. I'm Paolo. I'm his uh, colleague, but I'm just checking the, the link uh, for him because he's he's traveling and he'll connect, uh, connect in about 20 minutes or so. No worries. At the moment, we're pretty much in the practice session mode. So it's only us, the tech team and the uh, interpreters. So what we'll do, just to give you a quick brief, uh, just so you're in the loop, we're, we're going to set up the interpretation channels. So the interpretation will be available in four languages, English, Russian, French, and Spanish. And outside of that, uh, I'm not sure has uh, Bart pla planned any type of uh, PowerPoint or anything. Yes, so he'll be sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You can uh, perhaps, if you wish, uh, test out the share screen if everything's working fine on your end. And uh, yep. that's pretty straightforward. You just click the green button share screen in the middle and yep. share the file. And that's pretty much it. I'm just going to show you around. I just, just should see a PDF or so. And it works like a charm. OK, excellent. Perfect. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for your help. Yeah, my pleasure. If you have any questions at any point, feel free to reach out via personal chat message uh, to my The Right Street uh, here name under the participants list, and I'll be more than happy to help you out with whatever you may need. Okay, okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Marielle. Hello, Marco. How are you? Um, Mr. Van der Wetter, right? Uh, actually, as I was mentioning to the colleague, I'm I'm Paolo, so I'm I'm uh, Bart's colleague, but I'm just checking his link for him. Uh, meanwhile, but it, I just checked the screen, so everything works perfectly. He's currently traveling, but he'll connect in uh, in about twenty twenty five minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, but I'll I'll be following on the other end. So. Um, okay, great. All the all the best on the event. Thanks for putting it together. Thank you. See you. See you. See you. So I, I see we have Ivan Gorovenko as well in from the interpreters list. So what I'll do, Ivan, if we can do a quick mic check, I'll add you to the Russian channel in a few moments. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. So okay. I'll... I'll add you straight away to the channel and let's do a quick test. Thank you. Okay, so now you're added to the Russian channel. Shall we do a quick test on Russian channel? 
Okay, one, two, one, two. Well. Oh, perfect. Let's go to the English channel. Here am I again. Is, is it clear, loud and clear? Loud and clear, works like a charm. So I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, been a pleasure. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's uh, let's check if we have a couple of more of our interpreters in, so we can do another mic check. Okay, I see here Alejandro is with us. So Alejandro, shall I add you to the Hello. Spanish Hello. channel, and shall we do a quick mic check? Uh, yes, but I'm not in the booth yet. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I, I didn't get the invitation, so I'm. I'm still. Well, it's, since you can hear me, the general channel it means that I'm not in the, in the booth yet. Indeed, indeed. I'll, I'll yeah. add you now to the booth. Okay. Uh, just to check, Alejandro, you're doing Spanish English, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Perfect. From Spanish to English and vice versa. Update. Spanish English. Okay. Let's do a check on Spanish. Spanish. Now I want the Spanish channel. Perfect. I'm speaking on the English channel. Uh, I can't hear you on the English channel yet. Spanish channel. On the can Spanish channel, the Spanish I can channel? hear you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall we do English as well? Mm -hmm. Just to check. Now I'm on the English channel. I don't know Perfect. if you can hear me. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very Perfect. much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sh Alex, shall we set up also uh, your interpretation channel? Okay. So we set up Ale Alejandro. Let me check. Who else do we have from the interpreting team? So we can quickly set up as well, and then we will move on to the panelists. Uh, my Sorry, my colleague Philip is coming in a bit late because he's working this morning. So I'm going to be the one to start. No worries, no, not a problem okay. at all. Well, we got we got organized anyway, so uh, no no problem. Perfect. Uh, um, I see Maria Antonelli is as well here. So shall we set up an interpretation channel uh, for Maria on English and Spanish? Yes. Okay, I'll add you straight away. Just give me a second. So English and Spanish for Maria and Let's do a quick check on the English channel, Maria. Hello, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. On, on okay, English. shall we try the Spanish one? Indeed, let's do. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly on the okay. Spanish one as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So one last bit of info, we have Tatiana and we have Philippe who's going to be a bit later on here. So let me check, Tatiana's not still in the room as far as I see. No, okay. But pretty much we already have a good chunk of our interpretation team in. So, uh, Maria Alex, shall we wait, uh, let's say around 10, 10 more minutes? So we have our all of our panelists in, so we'll do a run through for our panelists. Yes, I think uh, with the panelists who, who are there, we can uh, check the sound and uh, the sharing of the screen if they need to present the presentation. So we can start. Um, we have uh, Mrs. Carling. Could you check your micro? Uh, I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we hear you well. And so uh, okay. you don't have a presentation, right? You're no. going to take the floor. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, we can uh, continue with uh, Mr. Bonner from Transparency International. Hi, hello. Hello. Hi, Hi everyone. We can hear you well. Okay. Uh, we have received a presentation from your side. Uh, could you check if you can share the screen to present your presentation? In this way, you will be more flexible to change the pages on your tab. Um, I had asked if, if um, you could do it from your hand, because I think it would be better for, for my okay. internet connection, if that's OK with you. Indeed, it's not a problem at all. Thank I'll, you. I'll do a quick, actually, share screen now just so we're aligned in terms that I have the uh, correct presentation on. Okay. So pretty much this is it, right? If I remember correctly. Yes, if you put the, yeah, the full screen. Indeed, um, I'll go into present mode. Okay. Uh, we're going to go straight at it. Excellent. So pretty much, I think this is, this is what, what we're rolling with. We're good. Good to go in terms of view. We're going to go into the full view during the event. So, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Super. So we can continue with uh, Mr. Uh, Itongwa, Joseph Itongwa. Bonjour. Bonjour, Joseph Itongwa. Uh, nous allons tester votre micro. Bonjour. Oui. Bonjour. On vous entend bien. Euh, on peut tester également votre caméra. Hello, good afternoon. This is Philippe, one of your French interpreters. Hello. Good afternoon, Philippe. I'll add you to the French channel so we can do a quick check. Um, yes. So, uh, yes. Bonjour, Joseph uh, Itungwa. Donc, on vous entend bien et on vous voit bien. Uh, Pardon, Marie-Alix, il y a quand même un bruit de fond chez Joseph, donc je ne sais pas s'il peut se déplacer. Je euh, pense que c'est, ouais. en tout cas, je sais que c'est le bruit de fond, mais son micro fonctionne bien. Je pense qu'il sera bien installé pour la conférence de 13 heures. D'accord. Je voulais puis... voir avec vous, euh, Monsieur Tangwa, euh, vous nous avez envoyé une présentation. Est-ce que vous préférez partager votre écran pour être indépendant, pour pouvoir changer les pages, ou vous préférez que Marco s'occupe de publier votre présentation Bon, il peut publier la présentation. D'accord. Parce que je ne suis pas sûr. De... Moi, j'ai des possibilités, le téléphone et l'ordinateur, la... ah, parce que nous sommes dans un milieu où il y a les problèmes de courant, tout ça. Donc, Donc j'ai pris l'option de ces deux, deux possibilités, soit sur l'ordinateur, soit sur le téléphone. Je si vous... l'un oui. si que... ne marche pas, je, je, je bascule sur l'autre. Alors peut-être euh, dans le doute, je vous propose que ce soit Marco euh, qui va publier votre présentation. Ok, ça va. Ok, et pour euh, 13 heures, vous pourrez être euh, bien installé. Euh, là, pour l'instant, j'entends plus de bruit de fond, donc ça me paraît bien. And then, Marco, um, so you have the presentation of uh, Joseph Tongwa. As he's not sure of having a, a good connection, uh, could you present it as well during the conference? Et puis, euh, mm -hmm. les, les, j'ai une confusion. Les 13 heures de... De Kinshasa, de, c'est de Bruxelles. Est-ce qu'il y a une différence? Um, là, à Bruxelles, il est midi 41. À Kinshasa, il est 11h41. Ah, donc, la conférence va commencer à midi. Donc, à l'heure de Kinshasa, j'espère que ça ira pour vous. OK. D'accord, donc ça sera dans, dans 20 minutes. Ok. À tout de suite, je continue euh, le tour. Euh, nous avons. Euh, 
We have uh, also uh, Mr. Uh, Hate Eddie with us. So we could uh, do a check uh, sound with Bonjour. you. Bonjour. Hi, Alex. Bonjour. Vous m'entendez bien? Ouais. On vous entend très bien. On vous voit bien. Euh, nous avons reçu aussi une présentation de votre part. Est-ce que vous préférez euh, la publier vous-même pour être tout Je pense que c'est mieux si je le fais moi-même. Je vais parler en anglais pendant la, la session. Ouais. Attends, voir. Attends. Vous voyez bien Donc là, on voit, voilà, c'est parfait. On a bien, ok, là, en plein écran, on a tout ce qu'il faut et super. D'accord. Voilà. Merci beaucoup, je vais continuer le tour. Pour l'instant, uh, for the moment, I don't have uh, more um, speakers, but I have one of our two moderators, uh, Elena Vidalik. We can uh, do a check sound. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Uh, not so well. Could you mm -hmm. try again? Okay. How about now? Yeah, can now you hear it's me? better. Yeah. Yes, great, yeah. okay. Um, I don't have a presentation, so I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, but is there a minute for me to check? I have one question, uh, Maria Lix, uh, if yes. that's okay. Um, so I'm correct that the Q&A will be uh, done through the chat box that is question and answer and not the regular chat exactly. channel. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So we have uh, one box for chatting and what box for Q&A and it's the only box that you're going to check and okay. Michel Rivasi will uh, precise this uh, during the introduction that okay. we are looking only for the box on Q&A um, and I'm going to give you an overview of the conference uh, when we will have uh, more um, speakers with us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you to you. Thanks. Um, so Mathias and Marianne, um, we are missing uh, Ella Merete Omar and uh, also uh, Vuti Bishop. If you can check your email to see if they don't have any problem. I just oh, sent her an email. I just yeah. sent her an email. Um, okay. So I hope she, she responds. Yeah, I okay. can do that also. Okay, super. Uh, Maria Lixa, can you confirm that um, participants will have a different view than us, that they will only have the panelists' view of the conference? I don't know. I'm going to check with Marco. I don't see a difference that uh, the viewer are going to have. I think all the, yeah. the speakers will be on the top. It's just uh, that um, Marco, I am wondering so uh, how it's going to appear for the viewers, but also uh, people like me, the organizer, we're going to disappear. Uh, yeah, basically, there's a couple of things that we're going to do for the event and actually how we're going to look for the for those who are attending. So in terms, it'll depend actually how they view the webinar, because they, in most options, it's the default speaker view. So in this case, you will see predominantly the person who speaks at that moment. So it would be me when I'm speaking, it would be you when you're speaking, uh, or in this case, it will be Miss Helena Vidalich when she's speaking, uh, Miss Rivasi when she is speaking. So unless the attendees choose to go into gallery view, they can do that. In general, it's not a practice, but the recording will be in general, only the person who's speaking. So on live stream, you'll only be seeing the person who's speaking at that given moment. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so, sorry. So we will not see the participants' camera because I think last time um, 
people, some people had their cameras on and uh, it really impacted the bandwidth. So this is something we want to avoid. There, this is something as well that uh, we're going to mention once, once we get all the panelists in. Uh, I was saying to Mary Alex, uh, let's give it three more minutes and I'll give a quick brief in terms of actually what we discussed at yesterday's test session as well. So whenever anyone is not speaking or scheduled to speak, from the panelists, they should turn off their cam and turn off their mics. So basically not a to utilize and spend too much bandwidth for others, but also at the same time for the recording purposes. So we actually record the people who are only speaking. The reason being that the automatic recording captures sound. So let's say we have a slight tap on my side like this, the camera will only turn to me, although I didn't say anything. Okay, so I'm going to continue the, the run. We have uh, Mrs. Karen uh, Zomberger. Hello, uh, could you check um, your song? And, uh, yes, hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, you're frozen. Indeed, indeed we can. It, it works like a charm. Uh, can we test the video as well? Yeah. Hello. Perfect. Oh, good. Okay. Hi. And a lovely painting as well. That's my friend. <laughs> I thought, but I will make sure that it's fit in the center. Yeah. Okay. Good. Super. Uh, we're gonna check the song of uh, Eva Meyerhofer. Um, All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. So we can hear you well and we see you well. So it's good. Thank you. So we are missing few speakers. Um, if I may jump in, I would just like to add if that works, Tatiana Alexeyeva to the interpretation Russian channel. So that will update now the Russian channel. And if we can do a quick check on two things, the Russian channel for Tatiana Alexeyeva and also for Phil, uh, the French interpreter, the interpretation channel. So I'll add now Tatiana. English Russian channel. Okay, I added Tatiana. Tatiana, can we do a quick test just on the Russian channel? Sure, I'm here. Okay. One, two, three. Perfect. English? English channel. One, two, three, English channel. Excellent. And if I may ask Philip Dunkel also to do a quick French test. Okay, no problem. This is Philippe testing the French channel. Works um, like a charm. Excellent. Do you want the English one as well? Let's check the English one as well. Here we go in the English channel. One, two, three, four. Excellent. One, two, three, four. Excellent. Thank you. Have a good meeting, everybody. You too. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, we have uh, one more speaker. It's uh, Mr. Freshet. Could you check your sound and your camera a few minutes? Um, hello, yes, super. bonjour. Um, bonjour. Hopefully this is coming through. Yeah, super. So it's going well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to do the same with uh, Elo Merete Omaha to check your song. Uh, Good afternoon. Do you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Super. So, Marie Alex, shall we just do a couple of info points for our panelists, just so in their, they're in the loop, uh, in terms of the technical details? Yeah, you can um, do the round about um, the technical details, and then I'm going to quickly explain all what will happen in the conference and the moderation. 
I'll okay, you. perfect. So I'll, I'll be short. In terms, uh, just for this actual uh, event, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, please, when you're not speaking, uh, turn off your microphone and uh, camera. Uh, once you are on, on the line to speak, please turn off your uh, camera and mic. And in the meantime as well, if you have any technical issues related to the presentations you, you might not be able to share or any technical issues with your equipment, feel free to reach out to me at the right street uh, here in the chat box. You can send me a private message and we can sort any issues that may occur. That's pretty much it on the technical side of things. The, the session is recorded. So that's one of the reasons why the mics should be muted unless you're speaking. Okay, thank you, Marco. And uh, it will be recorded and it will be also a live stream on the um, Facebook. Uh, we will uh, give the go uh, around uh, 1 p.m. when we start the conference with the introduction of uh, MEP Michel Rivasi. So uh, as uh, Marco say, when you don't have the, um, the floor, please mute yourself. And um, the more duration will be done uh, by MEP Michel Rivasi and uh, Elena Vidalik. So for each panel, it's uh, Michel Rivasi who's gonna introduce the panel and invite uh, every speaker to take the floor. Uh, she's going to present you and invite you to take the floor for 10 minutes maximum. And then every panel going to finish with a session of a Q&A. Uh, and for this, it will be Elena Vidalik who going to animate uh, the Q&A session. For this, she will uh, bring the question in the Q&A uh, box and uh, who has uh, the most support and she will read it and invite one particular speaker to take the floor. Um, yes, so if you have a technical issue, please don't hesitate to contact Marco via the chat uh, or, or another logistical question, you can contact me via the chat or on my mobile phone. So I think I gave you everything. Um, I also sent you yesterday the timing. If you want, I can uh, repeat it here for you. So the panel one will start at uh, 1.20 uh, with uh, Frédéric Ash. Sorry, I'm gonna check just with Michel Rivasi. Um, uh, sorry, Marco. Uh, yes, go. Michelle tried to connect. Um, it is asking a number of the meeting. Uh, the number of the meeting. Uh, well, it should actually let uh, let me resend her an invite on on her email. She'll receive a link. Uh, so I'll, okay. I'll resend an invite immediately now. Just okay, keep... let's do that. Uh, il dit qu'il va. Je vais te renvoyer un lien parce que c'est pas normal. Um, in the meantime, could we, uh, could you do a uh, check uh, of the son of Frederick Ash, who just arrived, Marco? Uh, okay, can you just please repeat? Just give me a quick second. Okay, can I do a check of uh, who, Frederick? Okay, uh, could I ask you, Frederick, just for a quick sound check in terms of the microphone? And okay, excellent. Is it okay? Can you hear me well? I can hear you perfectly and I can also see you. Excellent. Okay. Just a quick note. Uh, uh, I know I already mentioned to other panelists, when you're not speaking during the sessions, just if you can please mute yourself, just because the session is recorded so we can actually record the speakers. Perfect, thank you.
Hello. 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 Good afternoon. Hi. Yeah, I am confused with the time. I think the uh, the time difference is six hours, right? Uh, indeed, uh, between Vietnam, we're starting at thirteen hundred CET, so at one o'clock, in about two minutes. You are what? Oh, so it, now it, we are reached at six p.m. in one minute. Oh, so yes. it is a five hours, still five hour difference. Indeed, indeed. And uh, we're, we're kicking off, we're still in the practice session mode. So at the moment, we're not live to our audience. But yes, this is just yeah. a quick uh, technical check just to make sure that your microphone is working and also yeah. that the camera is working and all is working well, as I see. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of notes. If you may have any technical difficulties, feel free to reach out to me in the chat box. Uh, yeah. under the right street and mm -hmm. uh, one additional thing to keep in mind uh, when you're not speaking if you can mute your microphone just because mm -hmm. the session is recorded so we can record uh, the, uh, yes the... okay yeah sure yeah okay so we are, you are now 1 p.m so my, uh, so the meeting will start in uh, in a uh, couple of moments oh yeah okay Okay, I'm a bit confused. Sorry, thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. No problems. No worries. Okay, so, and the presentation because I have a presentation, so I I share in, in my screen or or, or you show from your side. Indeed, uh, if you can do. A so quick... we have uh, still uh, one minute. We have uh, checked all the speakers' uh, sound. We're still missing uh, Max Adler, but um, he's familiar with Zoom and he's coming a bit later. So we have uh, Michel Rivasini, uh, who's going to moderate um, this event uh, with uh, Elena Vitalik. She's going to introduce um, the conference in uh, one minute. Uh, we're going to give you all the to go so when you don't speak please mute yourself we're gonna be in live on facebook um you you will be invited so uh, sorry marco so yeah we're gonna put uh, maybe an image of uh, the conference no as the main um image of the, on the screen Okay, uh, just to check, basically, shall we do a quick check of the MEP Rivasi as well? Yeah, uh, Michel, est-ce qu'on peut vite checker ton son? Uh, oui, bonjour. Voilà. mais bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'être là, de participer à ce webinaire sur les solutions basées sur la nature. Alors, est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? On t'entend bien, on te voit bien. Bon. Super. Marco Intraveni, the second link for listening with the second device. Well, um, excellent. So, um, and Marco? Oh, yes. If I share my screen, does it work? Do you see my screen? Uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, it works perfectly. So, okay. I think we're good to go. Uh, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start the webinar. We go from practice session into real mode. And I'll also activate the Facebook live stream once we go into this live mode from the webinar. So I think if everyone's prepared, shall we kick off? Yeah. Okay. We are ready. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's kick off then. So we're now live and the attendees are slowly now rolling in. So I leave the floor to you. I'll share the image as well in the meantime. On peut commencer? Marco, on peut commencer. Marco, can we start? Indeed, we can. Let's go. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening. And thank you for being attending this webinar on the solutions based on nature and how to avoid uh, 
the capturing of land in the name of biodiversity. I'm very happy to welcome more than 500 participants with us. We are in we are live on Facebook, uh, and we will also be on the site of the organizer. Last year, we had a conference on biodiversity and uh, indigenous people, and uh, their uh, recommendations were strongly mentioned in the report, uh, which was adopted in the plenary, and practically everything we said uh, went through to the plenary. We focused the nature-based solutions, focused on nature-based solutions. It is a concept which is more and more often used, and it started in 2009 in the negotiations of the, within the UN, and it was used by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. The definition given is uh, actions aiming at protecting and sustainably managing ecosystems and natural uh, systems in an adaptive way, offering simultaneous advantages in terms of uh, biodiversity. And on the eve of the COP and uh, in COP15, and in the conference of the UN of the climate changes, COP26, the objective of this event is to stress the concerns of civil society on the specific use of solutions, nature-based solutions, especially on the compensation of carbon on, or biodiversity. For us, such measures can have uh, environmental and social consequences which are considerably negative and can uh, play a negative role in our fight against climate change. So for us, it is very important to organize this webinar because there will be several panels and uh, which uh, solution, which nature-based solution and financialization and so on, what are the, state, the things at stake, the impact on the indigenous peoples and uh, the point of view will in fact affect three continents and nature-based solutions. Are they, uh, are they going to maintain the status quo? There will be uh, people from the private sector and how can the EU uh, prevent the seizing of land and the nature-based solutions? So what is at stake is very important indeed. And for us, uh, such uh, nature-based solutions should not uh, come as a balance on compensation. I mean, that the rich countries could still uh, increase the greenhouse gas effects and then co simply compensate the countries in the South. So that would be a violation of human rights and the first victims would be the indigenous populations as well as the local populations. So this is a very important issue. And uh, before COP15 and COP26, uh, is, should we agree on a transparent and clear uh, framework based on nature and our fight against uh, climate change? And how can the biodiversity answer the concerns of the civil society, and especially on fortress uh, conservation, conservation? And there have been quite a lot of articles and books on everything green, especially on non-inclusive uh, issues. So quite a lot of questions mentioned in the various panels and discussed in the various passion panels. I would like to thank all the MEPs, such as Mrs. Rodriguez Ramos, Soraya, who represents Renew, and my friend uh, Mark Tarabella, representing uh, socialists and Democrats who are going to speak and also the co-organizers, which are the NGOs, DOSIP, FERN, and Transparency International. 
So the interpretation is going to be in English into French and uh, Spanish and Russian. The option can be found at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side. So there will be several panels which I'm going to introduce and then we'll be able to answer the questions of the public via Q&A. Uh, so I ask you to ask a few question or vote for those you like. I'm a co-moderator in this event with Elena Zadi from Transparency International, who will be animated animating the Q&A sessions towards five o'clock, uh, towards three o'clock, sorry, there'll be a break, a coffee break, and there will be animations, videos, and polls during that break. So I'm going to introduce the first panel now, and especially, um, especially the compensation based on nature for financialization and uh, compensation. So each uh, speaker should give me the definition on such uh, nature-based solutions. So the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature has given a uh, definition, but I ask you to uh, give me your definition because a concept can be quite different. So, and then um, this first panel, which is going to start, uh, uh, Frederick Ash is the co-founder and CEO of the Green Finance Observatory. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he studies the, um, all the bad signs of nature and the rights to destroy nature. So he's going, he's going to be listened to carefully. And then we will have Alain Frechette, who is the director of strategic analysis and uh, talking about the resources in the world. Uh, uh, what my colleagues, Mrs. Rodriguez, Soraya Ramos, are you here? Can you say two words? I give you the floor, Soraya, and uh, uh, very quickly, uh, what is your motivation to participate in such a webinar? Because what is interesting in the report on biodiversity, we work together and uh, it was a very ambitious report and I'm very happy about the vote in the plenary because all the themes we mentioned have been voted uh, with a great majority by all the MEPs. So it's a good sign when it comes to saving the biodiversity. Thank you very much. Of course, Michelle, thank you very much for organizing this. This is a very interesting event. And thank you very much also for giving me the opportunity to participate. I will be very brief to present this first panel and they will talk about what nature-based solutions are for them. So I would like to say how important this is in terms of our parliamentary work. We see a lot of reports that we are working on and we understand that this has to be one of the um, approaches that we work with. When we talk about nature-based solutions, we know that we have a very effective instruments to try to mitigate the um, food in, uh, insecurity, to try to mitigate climate change, and to try to avoid um, ca the catastrophes that we are seeing now around the world. But it is also true that there are other risks. We need to take into account that the concept is very broad. As Michelle Rabassi knows very well, when we were working on the biodiversity strategy, we were talking about allocating a budget related to the, these uh, nature-based solutions. But now at the same time, we are working on the eighth uh, frame, uh, framework program. This is um, something that we're working on in order to draft, uh, to draft a legislative report. And we see that this report is very broad. So we are allocating budget to something 
related to nature-based solutions, but if we don't have a concept that's clearly defined and that's common to all of us, then we may uh, allocate this budget in an inappropriate way. So this is why in this framework, we are asking for a European definition of nature-based solution and what it means to uh, support them. Of course, we also need follow-up methods, we need validation tools, and we also need measurable indicators so that we can actually measure, assess, and follow up on these um, nature-based nature solutions. So I think that this is incredibly important because we cannot allow projects like these ones to begin when they do not really um, correspond to global to the global standards that have been already established and because we may this may have a negative effect on the local communities on the indigenous peoples if we start projects and we are not sure about this i'm just going to be brief but i also want to say that i was the reporter of a report and my colleague rabasi also worked on it a lot this was a report on the consequences of climate change and its relationship with human rights for example we see land grabbing which is a very very important uh, problem that we see in developing countries and we know that this may have increased also because there were different projects and we know that sometimes um, they are based on these nature-based solutions because the um, right of these local um, populations the, these local communities to prior uh, informed concern has not been respected many times so i think that this project that we are working on all these reports are very important now all these reports are on the table and we can work with them on the parliament thank you very much merci soraya Thank you very much, Soraya. Uh, is my friend um, Abela here? So we're going to start with the first panel, which are the solution, the nature-based solutions, compensation and financialization, and what is at stake. So I'm going to give the floor to Frédéric Ash, who is going to explain. Uh, so don't forget give a definition of such uh, solutions and uh, and also to give us a definition of compensation financialization market which un is underlying when it comes to this concept mr frederick ash the floor is yours i will try to share my screen Is it working? Yes. Oui. So, oui, ça marche. Nature-based solution is one of these new fluffy and vague terms that have emerged over the past few years, together with uh, natural climate solutions or ecosystem-based approaches that are aimed at addressing climate change and biodiversity loss. Now, what are these nature-based solutions? Well, according to the European Commission, Nature-based solutions are solutions that are inspired and supported by nature, which are cost-effective, simultaneously provide environmental, social, and economic benefits, and help build resilience. Now, if that is clear to you, you are obviously smarter than me. In practice, uh, we see that these nature-based solutions encompass a broad range of good activities, from agroforestry to restoring forests and mangroves, but the problem is that they also promote an alleged monetary valuation of nature, as well as carbon and biodiversity offsetting, as Michel said earlier. According to the 2020 IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solution. So there is no if or but, there is no uncertainty about that. Offsetting is part of the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions, and it is also part of the European Commission uh, definition as per a written answer to a question raised by uh, Michel Rivasi earlier. Now, what is this uh, biodiversity of setting and why is it problematic? Mm. Well, first of all, 
this this involves a monetary valuation of nature, right? So nature is being reconceptualized as a series of so-called ecosystem services that benefits humans and all the rest, all that does not benefit humans directly is being considered useless and not worth preserving. And then service are then valued in monetary terms. Now, it is interesting because in reality, it has been shown that what is being measured is not nature, but only a few selected services, while the rest is willfully ignored for simplicity's sake. For example, under this approach, a river would be considered a recreational, um, recreational fishing services, and that's obviously a very uh, narrow-minded approach of it. And the pollution of the river could be evaluated only in terms of lost fishing days, whereas the impact on the local flora and fauna might be ignored. Um, and it has also been shown that the monetary valuation methodologies that are being used to, to put the, the values on nature are incredibly simplistic and biased, relying in most cases on surveys where you would be asked, for example, how much you're willing to pay for the Parc du Cinquantenaire to still exist next year. Now, as a result, the values being produced do not represent nature and not even a proxy. And so for all the talk about putting a price on nature, this is not what is actually being done simply because it cannot be done. So now let me ask you a question. The European Commission has published a figure earlier this year evaluating the value of nature in the EU at 234 billion euros. Now, what does this figure mean since we cannot live without nature? And also, in order to, to put it into context, this figure represents roughly one month of revenues for the oil and gas sector. Now, does such a figure, will such a figure help protect biodiversity or on the contrary, facilitate its destruction because that would be so cheap? And it is important here to, to make a, a clear <laughs> distinction and clarification. I mean, it's measuring and accounting uh, the state of our ecosystems in physical terms is a good thing. What is problematic is that the, the attempt at accounting in monetary terms, which is neither feasible nor necessary to protect nature. Now, the second issue with uh, nature-based solutions uh, that I mentioned earlier is offsetting. That is, instead of reducing our emissions or our destruction, we would plant a few trees or restore a few habitats, most often in low-income countries where land is cheap and claiming correctly that it compensates for our climate inaction and destruction. For example, imagine a real estate promoter wanting to build an airport in the south of Spain over a flamingo habitat. Well, he could fund the project to restore habitats for bats in Greece and claim that it has offset its destruction. But of course, we all know that more bats do not equal less flamingos. And while this example is an extreme form of offsetting, this is the one that was promoted at the 2016 IUCN Congress and the one that the European Commission has been promoting for more than a decade now. And here again, the distinction is essential and I want to be clear. Restoration is a good thing, as are some of the other activities uh, in nature-based solutions such as agroforestry. But restoration is different from offsetting. Uh, by definition, offsetting is about enabling future destruction in exchange for restoration or other actions. And so financing restoration activities through offset schemes, that is through the granting of permits to destroy more doesn't make sense. And it makes even less sense when it is allowed to compensate the destruction of an ecosystem by the restoration of another one in another place. And in fact, this lack of environmental integrity is reflected in the appalling track record of carbon and biodiversity offset projects. I mean, there's been plenty of data on that, but just to quote a few studies, uh, there was a 2017 study published by the European Commission that found that 85% of the offset projects used by the EU under the UN Clean Development Mechanism failed to reduce emissions. And likewise, uh, many studies have found when it comes to biodiversity offsetting that between two thirds and three quarters 
of biodiversity or restoration projects fail. Now, beyond the environmental failure, many of said projects have also been found, as Michel said, to be associated with human rights abuse from murder to rape to torture and to land grabbing, especially in low-income countries. Another crucial issue is the fact that these offset projects do not come in addition to curbing destruction, but in most cases, instead of, as be, and that's because both are being put on an equal footing within net gain biodiversity strategies or net zero emission targets. And of course, when restor, um, restoration and curbing destruction are put on an equal footing, uh, restoration and offsetting are chosen because they're so much cheaper. And all of this is not really surprising because as we understand it, the goal here politically is to address climate change and biodiversity loss only to the extent that it does not challenge economic growth and vested interest. Now, there's one last thing that I would like you to consider. And this is the enormous financial interest at stake in instrumentalizing nature-based solutions for offsetting. Nature is starting to be considered as a new asset class by the financial sector. And according to a recent report from the World Economic Forum, climate and biodiversity finance could unlock an estimated $10 trillion of business opportunities. Now, of course, this is framed as an alleged need to involve the private sector to finance conservation, and therefore a need to make conservation profitable in order to attract them. And yet, we all know that legislation mandating a reduction in biodiversity destruction does not require fiscal space at all, nor private finance. And so biodiversity offsetting and nature-based solutions are also starting to be considered part of sustainable finance, and they could therefore be a significant part of the 25 trillion euros of assets under management in Europe. And let that figure sink in. Imagine for a second what that would mean in terms of exponential growth of offset projects and the human and geopolitical implications of such a growth. And I want you to consider also the fact that this private finance does not come for free and brings with it the extremely high financial returns requirements, which means an ever increasing and completely misguided pressure to make conservation profitable, whether or not it trumps environmental integrity. And so for all the reasons mentioned above, offsetting is part of the problem and not the solution. And therefore, agroforestry, habitat restoration, and other positive activities should never be considered as or financed by offsetting, because doing so makes it worse than nothing. And yet, because offsetting is so much ingrained, embedded into uh, nature-based solutions, uh, whether in the IUCN global standard or the European Commission definition, we fear that the, the term cannot be salvaged. And for that reason, instead of using this tainted umbrella term, we now prefer to refer more directly and specifically to the good activities within NBS, such as agroforestry, for example. And one last word about the real solution. Well, the solution is for us to really refocus and prioritize on curbing destruction. And that would require, at the bare minimum, separate accounting for destruction and restoration instead of having net gain targets. Because when curbing destruction and restoration are mixed together, as is the case with offsetting or within net zero or net gain targets, well, first of all, it gives the misleading impression that they are comparable, it removes accountability, and it creates an ir irresistible temptation to destroy and restore instead of curbing destruction because the former is so much cheaper. Thank you very much. Merci, merci, uh, Frédéric. Thank you, Frédéric, uh, for your intervention. Uh, do you have, uh, you, you mentioned the term which I find very important, upsetting, which takes away uh, accounting. And um, I, I think, uh, uh, I think this is something you have to insist on. In my report, I did not use the, 
society based on nature, solutions based on nature, because I think it's a trap. Now I'm going to give the floor to Alain Fréchette, who is the director of the initiative. It's your turn now, Mr. Fréchette. Merci beaucoup, Madame Rivari, uh, Rivasi. Uh, je représente, Thank en fait, je voulais. Thank you uh, very much. I'll start. I'm sorry, I'll switch to English. I, I was distracted. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Rights and Resources Initiative, uh, which uh, is dedicated to the recognition of community land rights uh, across uh, the world. And so I'll be speaking uh, on nature based solutions from that perspective. Nature-based solutions are broadly defined by Natalie Sedon and colleagues as solutions to societal challenges that involve working with nature. Specifically, they imply a wide range of actions to protect, restore, and sustainably manage both natural and modified landscapes to achieve climate, biodiversity, and sustainable development goals. When anchored in culturally appropriate solutions and the self-determined priorities of local peoples, Nature-based actions have the potential to strengthen synergies, reduce trade-offs, transform human and fire interactions, and effectively drive system-wide transformation. Unfortunately, such strategies are increasingly associated with more limited and potentially harmful actions and investments. Chief amongst these are the compensatory actions conducted in one part of the world to redeem harms done by others elsewhere. Examples of this include the growing demand for climate and biodiversity offsets that fail to consider the historical and synergistic impact of greenhouse gas emissions, the permanence of biodiversity loss, and the social, economic, and cultural implications of land grabs, human rights abuses, and transformed rural economies. In the absence of robust and ambitious policy interventions to curb source emissions, decarbonize supply chains, and enhance progress towards human rights-based approaches, circular economies, and locally-led solutions, the sheer magnitude of land needed to mitigate the externalities of a growing and largely unsustainable global economic system will invariably exacerbate inequalities and injustices for the world's rural peoples. So what's at stake? Together, Indigenous peoples, local communities, Afro-descendant peoples hold customary rights to over half of the global land mass, but legally own only 10% of this area leaving them, the areas they steward, vulnerable to the growing demand for land, natural resources, and the pursuit of nature-based solutions. Yet evidence from the last decade shows that securing the land rights of indigenous community after the Senate peoples, and particularly the rights of women within these groups, while supporting their self-determined priorities and solutions, represents by far one of the most effective, equitable, and scalable solutions at our disposal. Forests that are legally owned and governed by communities exhibit lower rates of deforestation, store more carbon, are better protected, and support more biodiversity while generating more benefits for more people than forest lands managed by either public or private entities. As the Local Biodiversity Outlook and ICCA's Territory of Life report suggest, Indigenous peoples and local communities play an outsized role in the governance, conservation, and sustainable use of the world's nature and biodiversity. And their success is closely tied to the appropriateness of their locally adapted institutions, cultural traditions, and land ethics. Unfortunately, rural peoples everywhere face increasing challenges. Indigenous community, Afro-descendant peoples and women continue to bear the brunt of violence and criminalization perpetrated against environmental land rights defenders under the guise of pandemic and under the guise of the pandemic recovery plans. Communities now face increasing risks of rollbacks, diminishing civic space and growing threats to livelihoods and security. According to a recent study by RI in the Campaign for Nature, between 1.6 and 1.8 billion rural people live in important biodiversity areas and could be affected by plans to protect 30% of the planet by 2030, potentially exposing them to human rights abuses and forced displacements that continue to plague conservation efforts in many parts of the world. 
and yet recognizing their tenure rights would cost less than 1% of the cost of resettlement, in addition to generating broader livelihood and conservation benefits. Similarly, research published in Nature shows that some 300 million people live in areas targeted for tropical forest restoration. And many of these initiatives rely on intensive bioenergy plantations and monocultures planted in previously sustained natural forests and subsistence farmlands without the benefit of community-led solutions and contributions to more integrated and sustainable initiatives. Conditions for the realization of community rights in the context of emission reduction strategies from deforestation and forest degradation are not substantially better. Analysis of 31 red plant country, countries conducted by RI, RI and researchers from McGill University shows that only three countries rec legally recognize community rights to emission reduction credits and three others tied such rights to land and forest ownership. Only five of the total area, only half of the total area held by communities in the reviewed countries was legally recognized, placing their land and carbon rights at risk of capture by others. And overall, only five of the reviewed countries had developed benefit sharing plans and only two had operational feedback grievance redress mechanisms. More broadly, Community land rights have simply not been a priority of Red Plus countries nor international climate financing initiatives. As noted in a recent study by the Rainforest Foundation Norway, less than 1% of the total climate financing from the past decade has gone to support indigenous peoples and local community initiatives. And only a fraction of this was dedicated to securing the collective land and resource rights. Amidst these various challenges, there remain credible grounds for optimism. First, the science is clear. To achieve global climate and biodiversity goals, we must dramatically improve the protection and sustainable use of our living world and bring an end to all activities that directly or indirectly impinge on this. But in order to get there, we must first protect the sovereignty and dignity of indigenous and local communities over their lands, the knowledge they hold and the values we should all adhere to. Second, most tropical forest countries have legislative instruments that could facilitate the legal recognition of community-based tenure rights. And we now have the tools and instruments needed to characterize such opportunities and scale up action. Third, there's now a groundswell of support for rights-based climate conservation and sustainable development action marked by increasing donor coordinate coordination and engagement to support self-determined climate and conservation priorities of rights holders. Fourth, many of the most influential companies and investors behind the demand for nature-based solutions are acutely aware of the risks posed by insecure land rights and are eager to work with civil society and rights holders to identify alternative pathways to overcome emerging threats. Fifth, we now have a robust land rights standard to support rights-based approaches in the context of climate, biodiversity, and sustainable development actions and investments, and ensure that all future actions are effectively, equitably, and transparently realized. Finally, rights holders are increasingly connected, coordinated, and mobilized to effectively engage national and international constituencies, advance their self-determined priorities, and pursue collective actions while holding public and private actors and institutions accountable for their actions. Together, these elements provide reasons for hope in the advancement of rights-based natural climate and biodiversity solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Frechet. Uh, you were quite accurate about all the solutions which had to be integrated. I would like to give the floor to Marie-Ange Buffern, who was to take the floor at the very beginning. Marie-Ange, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michel Rivasi. Thank you to Soraya Rodriguez and Marc Arabella. 
I just wanted to thank you in the name of the EU to have us associated to this event that I represent the FERN, but also including Transparency International to this event. I believe you have already said everything that has to be said in your introduction and uh, Frédéric as well as Alain have highlighted the dangers that they are here to promote uh, a concept which is still quite uh, undefined and could uh, lead to some abuse. So as an NGO work on uh, societal issues and good governance on the environment, our concerns are exactly the same. They are based on the concept on how those nature-based solutions have been defined of the local population, those whose uh, land could be grabbed? Do they have their word to say? Have they been consulted at the political level also? Is it a question to do with a like a diversion with a lot of smoke and instead of facing the issue straight on and to really reduce the evolution and give a, a chance for offsetting in, indeed? And also it's a bit of a pity that uh, we have to reinvent the wheel when some good practices are already available that was highlighted by Alain, but also by Frédéric in terms of uh, management, uh, community management of the rights to the forest and so on, but also when it is to, to do with fighting criminality and uh, I'm talking about the voluntary agreements uh, which have been um, put in place with uh, the EU. So we are quite uh, eager to associate to everything that was said so far and uh, call on the EU Parliament to help us define the, uh, in a more clearly way the nature-based solutions that would integrate and encompass the rights uh, for the local population and that it doesn't lead to a situation as a business as usual, a usual scenario when nothing much changes, when we keep on wanting to grow and, uh, and have a lot of emissions. So again, thank you for associating us and thank you to all the speakers so far. Thank you. Thank you, Marie-Ange. I don't know how we can talk about it without involving all NGOs. You know, we won't be able to find a solution by them by ourselves. We will find it all together. And like you in the last panel, we will have uh, members of the commission who will participate. So I believe it's extremely important that we all listen to each other and we are able to frame a lot more those nature-based solutions, because if we leave it as they are, indeed, they will be a source for abuse that we won't be able to control. I will now give the floor to Joanne Carling, who represents uh, the members of the caucus and um, for the indigenous people for sustainable development. Joanne Cutting, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for giving me this um, opportunity to speak uh, as an indigenous uh, leader. And this is a very timely discussion uh, now that we are going to, uh, and, uh, the, the COP, the, the negotiations is going to resume at the end of, the, of this uh, month where nature-based solution will be given a uh, center stage. And like the others, uh, indigenous peoples also share our concern on how this, uh, how uh, different interpretations are being made to suit the interest of particular groups uh, in, in the way they want to define nature-based solutions. Uh, but what is ir ironical from the perspective of indigenous peoples is that we, we cannot justify uh, the continuing destruction and, and pollution of the environment on one hand, and at the same time uh, justify the, those actions by what is called the nature-based uh, solutions it's 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 uh it's a skewed uh concept from the perspective of indigenous peoples because what we see as as the approach uh, should be to the climate uh, uh crisis in relation to uh the the problem of of carbon emission is to address carbon emission at the source and not justify it by so-called nature-based solution without regard to the stewards of nature in the first place who are actually the ones taking care of nature. The other one is also what we should look into the root causes of biodiversity loss 
and, and address it as such. What are the factors leading to the loss of biodiversity? And, uh, and, 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 and look at provide the solutions to this instead of coming out with concepts that uh, isolate nature from people. So I, I, I just wish to uh, add those points in the further discussion into today's very important uh, session because uh, others have already mentioned a lot of, of things, so I don't want to repeat those. Uh, thank you. Merci, Joan Carling. Uh, thank you, Joan Carling. We will now go into the question and answers for our two speakers, Frédéric and Alain. I can see some questions have been asked with uh, Stéphane Girard, who said, who will assess those nature-based solutions? What will they take into account? Will they take the human rights into account? And a second question, what will be the first measures needed to address that issue, that, that problem? And do you think that this nature-based uh, solution approach is not a greenwashing approach that benefit mostly to large companies in the sense that they, they are able to keep on polluting and emitting greenhouse gas, gases, I'm talking about petrol companies or mining industry, and at the same time, or keep on destroying biodiversity and the forest in the countries of the South. Can you share some elements of answers to those questions? I will give the floor to Frédéric and Alain to answer that question. Thank you, Michel. As we talked previously, indeed, there is a huge risk for greenwashing around that concept of nature-based solutions, in particular when it comes to offsetting. And we saw already some large multinational companies, I won't mention here, who have both such programs based on nature-based solutions in one, one hand, but at the same time are still planning to increase their emissions. So it's clearly a case of greenwashing. It's a, a major issue. And in a, a broader term, in fact, it's a bit of a distraction when we are faced with the necessity to reduce those emissions. It's a bit like an elephant in the room, like we say in English, and the one missing character actor in that actor, which is about modifying our lifestyles and being more sober in the way or the type of growth that we want to have, which is absolutely not there in the political debate, which but is a physical reality that we cannot avoid. If you look at all the reports of the IPEC and so on, and those nature-based solutions in a way can be in, used as an instrument at political level in order to avoid talking about the necessities that we have to change our lifestyles. So in that way, they are excellent for the economic growth, but a catastrophe, a disaster for the environment and the generations to come. I can maybe add to that contribution and maybe bring some other answers to the table. I believe what is very important is on how we assess the impact or the effects of those actions uh, on nature-based solutions. There, there is currently an initiative which have been led by the communities themselves in order to monitor and assess the different projects and investments which are deployed on the ground. This is an initiative uh, which is ground up from the base to the top end, which enable them to have a good view on the actual actions on the ground and led by the local population and the communities. There is also a standard which is being uh, designed 
which is the tenured right tenure uh, standard, which is based on that fundamental principle in order to uh, dedicate all investments and uh, equitable investment at the, at the scale of the landscape of the different countries where we are involved. That initiative, which has been jointly launched by the indigenous group, major group, who is represented here by Joanne Collins, Joanne Carling, and also my organization and a lot of other organizations are calling on basic principles to ensure that the investment which are dedicated either in that context of nature-based solutions or uh, any other context or any other activities will actually help us uh, meet the demand and the, for the rights of the local communities and indigenous people and to ensure that all the investment will benefit everybody. So these are some of the solutions that we can uh, put in place to assess the initiatives and the quality of the initiatives to ensure that the investments dedicated have got the impact on the ground that they're expected to have. Very well. Straight after that, I would like to ask the question maybe to Joanne Carling and then to Alain. How can we be sure that those assessments related to the investments that will be undergone, will be deployed in locations where indigenous people live? How can we ensure that those population will not be booked? I hear it a lot. The, the indigenous people have to be informed, they need to have access and consult to documents and projects and uh, consult it. But at the same time, with the amount of money that it represents, is there not a risk that those population could be booked, booked over? Can, how, can we be, how can we do to ensure there is a multiplicity of partners? The question is for Alain and for Joanne Carlin. Go, you go ahead, Alan. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll respond to uh, the question in English. Um, so uh, from our perspective, uh, Indigenous peoples, local community, Afro-descendant uh, peoples are increasingly well organized and sophisticated and, and armed and equipped to advance their priorities. And in fact, are collaborating with a multitude of uh, allied organizations to ensure that their rights are first and foremost secured and protected. Uh, yes, uh, all communities, all people across the world will always uh, be uh, face incentives that will drive actions that might not always be consistent with um, uh, the collective well-being. However, um, our experience shows that this is a very, very small minority of cases. In most circumstances, communities, because they make decisions together, because they're organized collectively, and because they have their strong governance background and uh, moral ethics linked to uh, the preservation and protection of their land rights, and and uh, customary um, uh, traditional knowledge, they have an inherent um, uh, desire to uh, advance and support initiatives that effectively recognize and protect their uh, customary land and resource rights and not sell them off to the highest bidder. So I think these are a uh, lot of things happening on the ground and evidence shows that the, this is not, it's just, it's simply not the case that communities are selling out to the highest bidder. Joan, I, I'm sure you have lots to add to this. Yeah, uh, let me begin by saying that normally funds are being used to divide, to divide communities uh, so that they can control over the people's lands. So there is a clear agenda already at the outset for many to uh, use funds to take over, to control uh, the land and then divide the, the communities. And in cases where some are bought, uh, these are normally the minority uh, in terms of number. They, these are not the, 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 normally these are the ones that are not living in the community, but are part of the community. So if, we, if it, it's, it's true that, that funds can be used not to, to buy people, but at the same time, if, if we look at uh, what is the real interests of the community, they would always go for 
them deciding on how they best manage and still have control over their lands, not only for the present, but for the future generation. So I, I, I think it's important to, to caution all already and, and uh, the, the, the source of, of funds that when they engage with indigenous peoples, we need to engage in the spirit of respect and having them and, and them having a control over their lands and resources and not to use these funds to divide and control their lands because that is not the spirit of partnership. So if ever we engage with indigenous peoples and, and with finance, it has to be in a respectful developing, a respectful relationship. Uh, so, so, so it will not cause that kind of divide that eventually then, the, then because the, the donors or the government has, has more power, then they can simply overrun communities. And that's exactly how funds are being used to uh, divide and control indigenous people's lands. And that we need to be worried about. Merci, Joanne Carling, de cette réponse. Thank you very much for this answer. I will give the floor to Elena Zagli from Transparency International, who will continue this session. We have until 2 p.m. before we start the second panel. You've got the floor, Elena. To be here with you and help out with the answers. Uh, or questions rather. Um, I will start with a, a Russian question. I have a, the translation here in French. So uh, please select the, the correct um, language channel for you. Um, en Russie, dans les pays RFE, les entreprises industrielles camouflent et déforment le principe. We see that industrial uh, uh, companies are uh, disguising those ways and they don't have any dialogue for the consent. That means the companies go without a prior consent and without a dialogue. How can we work with such companies? I believe that those questions could be addressed to Frédéric and Alain, that same question. Maybe I will let you answer that question first, and then we have a numerous other questions, and some of them are more popular. We'll have to see how much time we've got left. Alain, do you want to answer it first? Please go ahead, Frédéric. It will be simpler. What is interesting here is that all the safeguards and limitations that we use for the language to avoid such abuse. It's in fact not quite new. It's been in the UN text for years and decades and has a relatively little impact according to us, which is not quite surprising because at the end what we talk here is a relationship around power. There was a, a journal, an article that will be published in five days, pluridisciplinary uh, document, research paper on why there is a failure after 30 years and uh, on those the initiatives. There, there is an interesting point is there is a common thread that emerged out of it, uh, is that the reason why we've been failing for the last 30 years in addressing climate change, and it's the same with biodiversity, it's not an issue to do with a lack of solutions, a lack of awareness. No, it's a question of relationship in power and interest economics which are in place to want to maintain a status quo. So if we approach that in such a way, indeed to have limitations in terms of the language that we use it's something that we have to do in in order to define that uh, balance of power and uh, fatally will have little chance to be a success which has it been uh, which has been so far the case i would like to add on that uh, answer from my colleague is that there is within the sec private sector, there is a desire, a will which is stronger and stronger to acknowledge and recognize the risks related to the investments deployed on nature-based solution and nature-based solutions, initiatives and so on, as well as in the uh, active economic development. By doing so, 
there is a desire and we note that and we welcome that an increasing demand from the organizations to organize a direct dialogue with the communities with indigenous people in order to identify and take some actions to reduce their risks related to those investments that would uh, potentially could not uh, be successful and ensure that the actions that we offer will have some positive impact and positive uh, consequences which will be directly beneficial to them and and also the communities they are involved with in fact those organizations do not have any interest to harm the communities. And by nonetheless, by exposing the risks related to those investments and in identifying solutions to address those risks, we believe there is a way to minimize the impact of such investments and ensure that the nature-based actions as well as investment to uh, development will have positive uh, and sustainable impact for communities and the companies. Maybe Frédéric and Alain, if you have time and if you're willing uh, to join us on the Q&A and uh, type some of your answers, I think that would be really helpful. And I would also like to ask the participants to um, go into the Q&A section throughout the event today and also vote on the questions that you already like. That allows us to then select the questions that seem to have the most support so that we can make the most of the, um, of the Q&A section at the end of each panel. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, so that's pretty short. Um, so I will hand over back to Michel uh, to take us into the, the next um, panel. Uh, but again, thank you, everyone. And please, let's stay um, lively on the Q&A. Merci, Elena, d'assurer la... Thank you, Helen, Elena, to uh, make sure that people answer question that you answer question and answers. Now, the second uh, panel is the impact of nature on uh, local communities and indigenous people. So we try to broaden the discussion on three continents: Vietnam, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Norway, and John Carling we saw before, who is going to talk on the Philippines. The first um, speaker is, uh, I, I won't pronounce her name, uh, the person who is the CEO of the Sustainable Development and Wen Tin Tok, the director of the Center for Development of Communities, of the Eco Communities in Vietnam. So I'm going to give you the floor because uh, acknowledging uh, land rights is the condition which is necessary before any discussion and on how to manage the world uh, climate agenda. So I think this is very important to hear your point of view with solutions and uh, also local problems, local issues. And, uh, uh, rose in your territories. So the floor is yours, Mrs. Wittebich Hope. I hope I pronounced it properly. Uh, uh, can you hear me? But yes. Okay. So good evening from Vietnam. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this event. And uh, I, I would, would like to share the presentation. Uh, just a minute. Um, yeah, so here, can you, can you see the presentation? No, we can't see, see it, uh, uh, no. Oh, no, sorry, um, just, just uh, uh, let, let me try, because uh, I normally, uh, yeah, here, um, no, I see, look, let's stop, yeah, just a minute, okay. Uh, if you can try tapping on the green screen share screen. 
Yeah, I say screen, yes. I, I normally have no problem, but my laptop just uh, have the kind of uh, just one minute. Um, no. Yeah, I, 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 I click on the share screen and, and click on my uh, already open the, the file. But no. Uh, sh shall I load up your presentation as uh, we have it as well? So, okay. okay, that's very good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No worries. I'll set it up in one moment. And whenever you need the next slide, you just indicate to us next okay. slide and we'll fire it up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Sorry you. Sorry for this. We don't test this earlier. Okay. That's good. Yes. Can you make it in, in full? Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is my uh, very, uh, short presentation because time is only 10 minutes. So uh, we want to share uh, experience from civil society organization in Vietnam. So I present on behalf of uh, um, Hoàng Thị Ngọc Hà and my name is uh, Vũ Thị Bích Hợp and you can call me Hợp. So I come, uh, I'm the director of the Center for Sustainable Rural Development, SRD. Next slide, please. So the, in this, uh, I have uh, four contents, uh, current status of forest in Vietnam in brief. And the second one is an overview of the role of Vietnam civil society in climate change response and natural resource management. And third is the status of uh, nature-based solution related research and practices. And fourth is the recommendations. Next slide, please. You see the, the map of Vietnam and the current status. So I will not go into too detail, but uh, the, two, the one important point is Vietnam is the one of the world's 16 most biologically diverse countries. And we have uh, 34 national parks and uh, 11 world biosphere reserve, nine Ramsar sites and other nature reserve, marine conservation, habitat conservations. And we have a 70% of forest is a natural forest. And the forest cover rate is a 42%, uh, the latest data in 2021. But uh, of course, uh, an annual um, forest loss, still, still, even the government applied the very strong measures, but still ongoing. Next slide, please. And the, this is uh, really the di diagram that you can look at for you to easy to see the total production, uh, total forest total and production forest, special use forest and protection forest. That is that we divide into different forests. Next slide, please. And the, um, the current policies, we have a number of policies, but here I just want to emphasize on some important uh, policies. That is uh, the, um, for example, the decision number 120, the issues in 2015 on development of coastal forests to cope with climate change during 2015, 2020. Actually, it is already expired and they are working now on the new uh, policies. National Red Plus strategies, forestry law. Uh, this is the updated in 2017, but applied from 2019. And Vietnam, of course, NDC 2020, environmental protection law 2020 degree. This is important with people who are familiar with the VPA flexi, the decree 102 on uh, Vietnam timber legality assurance system and VPA flexi ME framework. And uh, very in, uh, recently in uh, April, the government, the prime minister launched the 1 billion trees planting. And also we have a new Vietnam forestry development 2021-2030 uh, with vision to 2050. Next slide, please. So I, I like to give you some ideas of how Vietnamese civil society can contribute in climate change and natural resource management. So we have a network, for example, the Vietnamese NGO like a 
SAD and uh, ECOP is are the members of the 130 civil society and SAD is the chair of the network. We also have a climate change working group. It includes of Vietnamese NGOs and also international NGOs and donors. Currently we have 1,400 subscribers. And today we just hold the, uh, the pre-COP 26 meetings uh, today with the, the embassy of the UK embassy and also with the Monterey, the Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment. We have a regular uh, dialogue with DCC on, uh, on NDC, on NAP, NAP National Adaptation Plan, MNE, and gender mainstreaming. And we actually, the, we just organized the nature-based solution training for key international and national NGOs members in July. And we are in the process of reviewing our current strategies to formulate new one with a wide range of intervention, including N NBS. Next slide, please. So areas, so you can see in the map of Vietnam, the areas of civil society work. So we cover all the uh, regions and our focus on ethnic minority. We don't call um, indigenous peoples because in Vietnam, ethnic minority is a, a kind of multi uh, ethnics. So we don't, we don't call the IP. So when you, I talk about ethnic minority, you can maybe similar to the IP. And next slide, please. So status of NBS, uh, the, actually the eco -based, ecosystem based approach adaptation was first introduced in Vietnam through research in, in the year of 90s and have the first part pilot study in uh, 2011, 2014. And then later, 2015-2018 in Quang Binh, Hà Tĩnh and Hai Phong. Government and civil society project mainly refer to EBA or similar why NBS is still a new concept. Vietnam has submitted the NDC in which the use of NBS for climate mitigation include forest related mitigation is mentioned, but it is not really clear on, by, on billion trees as I talk and to mobilize all stakeholders. Private sector participated largely in production forest management, mainly acacia plantations. Next slide, please. So uh, I give some example of the EPA NBS related practice in Vietnam. You can see the ecological soft embankment to prevent river bank and canal erosions. And we use vertebrates to reduce the risk of drought and flood, protect infrastructures and also natural forest restoration, planting native trees combined with land reclamation for livelihood on sloping lands. So these, these are pictures to illustrate uh, my point. Next slide, please. Also, uh, SRD have a working experience in uh, sloping land in the, with ethnic minorities people. So I give you some example of our project our ongoing projects, promoting the use uh, of uh, IPM for cultivation, rehabilitation and using the indigenous crops and trees, and also developing agroforestry and native tree planting to reduce soil erosion and drought, and promoting the use of crops by product for feeding animals. So these kind of pictures, you can see how we work with the local communities to try to pull to protect the biodiversity and to build the resilience against climate change. Next slide, please. The, the, so the concerns and potential risks from the application of NBS and EBA. Actually using the NBS and EBA is in for economic profit activities. So they occupy lands, destroy forests, privatizing common resources for company forest, land, water, resources, river, lake, sea, and occupying forest, land, nature, conservation in the name of ecotourism, eco-agroforestry tourism in mountainous and coastal localities. Privatization of forest area and reduce access to land and forest resources for local communities. 
and the misconception that NVS is a substitute for rapid phasing out of fossil fuels. And still a number of incidents of natural forest illegal logging for timber and land encroachment. Forest land conservation still continue with agriculture expansion, ecotourism, infrastructures, and also of course encroachment. Next slide, please. So the, the, this is the last line. Uh, uh, that we want to recommend NBS should be clearly defined in the context of NDC and NAP. Support for conducting evidence-based study on the current status of NBS, focus on wood practices and land grabbing under the name of conservation. Strengthen communication and training on NBS, EBA and proper use of NBS in the implementation of economic growth. NBS must contribute directly to core benefits for human well-being at the national and local levels. And the last is to strengthen the capacity of civil society, local governments and communities on NBS, EBA implementation and, and NME uh, monitoring and evaluation. Next is the just uh, next slide is just thank you with the uh, our information. So in case you you can uh, contact us through email here. Thank you for your attention. I, I noticed that I go over one minute. Thank you very much for your listening and feel free to go to let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Directrice Générale. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh... I think you're going to have questions, but uh, I think it, it's, it's going to be once all the speakers have actually given their speech. I'm, I'm going the floor to Joseph Itongwa. He is the coordinator and uh, he's part of the indigenous and local populations for the management uh, of the forest. Uh, in, he represents, in Central Africa, he represents the Democratic Republic of Congo. The floor is yours, Mr. Itonga. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate in this big event. And And uh, I would like to thank all the organizations and, and I, I talk in the name of the sub-regional platform of the uh, uh, indigenous people of Central Africa and the Congo Basin. And even if the problematic of the Congo is um, is the biggest country, it's the main forestry country in, uh, in Africa and Congo. And I think I I'm going to share my screen. Thank you very much. Please, uh, we would like to see you. Uh, we only see half your head. Uh, the interpreters need to see your, your mouth. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to share uh, my presentation. I sent it to the technicians. I don't know if they can uh, open it. Yes, thank you very much. So um, I, ha I have three elements in my presentation. The first one is precisely um, I wanted to support our values and practices and traditional practices and uh, with the integrity of the forests. So the second element will be uh, our opinion when it comes to financialization of nature is and uh, not on the rights. And uh, finally, the recommendations in, in all the um, indigenous uh, milieu when it comes to nature and uh, ecosystem, they are not virgin. And, uh, we, we, and because of climate crisis, uh, we're trying to find solutions, but more than 1 million of uh, indigenous and local communities live uh, through and by nature. And with this nature, 
we have uh, social, cultural, and economic uh, relations, and we've had that for ages. Uh, we live closely to nature, and that explains um, that uh, we are uh, supposed to preserve uh, nature and the forest. And as uh, John uh, Carolyn said, said that it's already a value and it's a concept, the destruction of nature is already uh, consequences of our um, uh, attitude to nature. Can we move on to the next slide? Okay, okay thank you. Uh, if we only take the RDC, we can talk about more than 155 million forests in good states, and uh, they are where we live, as we as indigenous people live, and their high values uh, of biodiversity, our practices and values guide and have guided the traditional standards which uh, ruled our behavior towards nature. We know the advantages and dangers of certain practices uh, to, uh, for nature, and this is our heritage and has been our heritage for the generations to come. And uh, uh, we have uh, revitalization of our uh, traditional knowledge for our sanitary, our health and cultural uh, well-being. Uh, we wanted to show that uh, culture includes nature. The next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, can we move on to the next one? Okay. So, so when we're talking about uh, nature-based solutions, can, can, can we go back to the previous one? Okay. So. Uh, the efforts and contributions of the uh, indigenous programs just ignored in many uh, international programs of the protection and sustainable de development. There are other solutions, and I can see that uh, uh, there's a respect for the rights uh, when there's no e equity for the indigenous people. The practice uh, programs and approaches of cons exclusive uh, conservation in the RDC or in most countries of the Congo Basin uh, have been um, exacerbated by establishing protected areas and they've had a negative impact on the lives of, of indigenous peoples, such as. Uh, uh, taking the land and uh, taking away traditional means of survival. The next uh, slide, please. The financing of the conservation in Central Africa does not benefit enough to the indigenous uh, people while the protected areas are established in the territories, which we have uh, managed for ages uh, today. Because of international events, uh, we have problems with the widening of the conservation spaces to 30% as planned under the new global framework post-2020 framework. In negotiation presents risks of expropriation of the traditional lands of the indigenous people and violation of their rights. And how are those questions uh, going to be discussed of the community, local community? No alternative has been planned and on the widening of uh, the ter um, conservation terrestrial land spaces. Can we move on to the next slide, please? And now um, we have to uh, move to uh, solutions. And the issue is how can we guarantee the, protect, uh, the legal protection and secularizations of the territories uh, of life of the indigenous communities and local communities and prescribe other efficient measures of conservation 
uh, and uh, research, natural research, ecological reserves and community reserves to valorize the traditional knowledge of conservation. How can we guarantee access and uh, ensure fair and sharing of benefits from the conversation? And we have to protect the rights of the indigenous people and local community. Uh, the efforts, uh, historically, the uh, efforts which are still being made, uh, we have to know that uh, there's a link between the cultural value and the pr promotion of biodiversity. How can we have access to this fair sharing and the, of the, the areas and of the profits? How can we protect the indigenous and community and local communities? We, we lost you, Joseph. There's no connection anymore. Uh, you have to connect again. Uh, can you hear me? I don't know. I believe Joseph at the moment is having uh, connection issues. Je, je De connexion. Mm. Euh, moi, je vous propose, avant qu'il se reconnecte, just that before he connects again, allez-y. Go ahead. I suggest uh, before he connects again uh, to give the floor to the next speaker, Omar, who is the head of the un uh, unity in uh, the European uh, Parliament and uh, who is also a member of the indigenous uh, people in Norway, from Norway. Elimirete Omar, are you there? I certainly am here. Can... Ah, bonjour. <laughs> bonjour. Bonjour. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, while uh, he's trying to connect again, please uh, go ahead with your presentation and indicate what happens in Norway since you represent the SAMI committee. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Distinguished guests, sisters, brothers, and dear friends, the quantity and speed of climate change, as well as lots of biological diversity and erosion of ecosystem have never been more pronounced than they are today. From the extraction of rare minerals in Sweden as part of the green colonization to large scale <laughs> land industrial sites, sites for production of wind energy on reindeer pasture land, to oil and gas exploration in many vulnerable ecosystems in Norway and extensive logging in all parts of Sápmi, the global resource bonanza yeah. the fact. So my name is Elle Meretta Oma and I'm working at the Sámi Council, which is an organization that represents the Sámi civil society in Norway, Sweden, Finland and the Russian Federation. The Sami people are a nomadic indigenous peoples that are living within the borders of the EU and thus are citizens of the European Union. So today I will offer you some thoughts from an indigenous peoples within the U European Union. The Sami have pursued reindeer herding since time memorial and reindeer husbandry constitute the backbone of Sami culture. Without reindeer herding, the Sami culture cannot survive. One of the most important pressures and threats to the Sami people are due to land use change. Land use change complete, uh, depletes the landscape of the structure that were, were previously very common, such as natural forests, old forests, uh, ponds and streams. The loss of biodiversity results in an unhealthy ecosystem and unbalance in nature. The Sami people depends on the healthy ecosystem in order to continue to live in Sápmi. 
The intensified forestry in Sápmi results in loss of biodiversity, um, loss of biodiversity in nature and threatens the production of lichen, which is the main resource of food during wintertime for the reindeers. This has become a source of conflict between reindeer herders and the forest um, industry. At the moment, there's a question if the reindeer husbandry can survive in the intensified commercial forestry if uh, is allowed to continue. But you have a chance to support us and help the indigenous peoples of the EU by ensuring our voice when you in a few weeks time will vote on the new EU forestry strategy. Dear friends, the role of nature-based solutions in tackling climate change and nature crisis has gained the world's attention. The Sami people have since time memorial used nature to support our way of life and time has pro proven that we have done it in a sustainable manner. However, we note with concern, as we have heard today, that there is a confusion as to what exactly counts as an NBS. Such lack of clarity has permitted the misuse of NBS for greenwashing by companies that drive climate change and overemphasis on carbon market offsetting instruments that seems to steer us away from the really important issue the need for real climate solution that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So today I will um, share three main recommendations or ideas. Uh, the first one is, um, to me, NBS means that our traditional way of life is protected and recognized as a way to ensure biodiversity based on human interactions with the nature. However, I note that some of the proponents of MBS consider nature as an economic asset, which means that it will, it will be, pardon, that it will generate future benefits, while at the same time priori prioritizing those actors who can invest in these same territory. If MBS are favoring the private, privatization of forests, it can result in that indigenous peoples who live and depend on the forest in their traditional territories are being left aside. And we are currently experiencing this it in Sweden and in Finland. Indigenous peoples as stewards of much of the world's remaining bio biodiversity are leaders in how to develop sustainable, resilient and effective solution to climate change to our knowledge, innovations, technologies and spiritual values. One must not forget that, that biodiversity is declining less rapidly in the lands and territories in a, managed by indigenous peoples. For indigenous peoples, nature has more than financial or economic value. The issue of seeing nature as an asset leaves aside its culture and spiritual values. The second point that I would like to highlight is apart from conservation efforts and the creation of protected areas, other actions are being promoted under NBS, such as tree plantation, many of which depend largely on monoculture and commercial tree plantations rather than native tree plantation to restore ecosystems and protect biological diversity. Let me remind you that tree plantations store only a fraction of the carbon that natural forests could store. And forests are more than carbon sinks and can provide many environmental, social, cultural benefits. But what does that mean if we're gonna translate it to a Sami context and to a European context? Let me give you an example. Rain and mild weathers during winter season often freeze to an isolate air, which prevents reindeers from accessing lichens under the snow. Lichen is a vital food resource during winter time for reindeers. Since time memorial, herders have moved to their, their herd to old forests as a natural mitigating measure to harsh conditions during winter time. The frequency of rain and mild wind weather during winter has increased due to the consequences of climate change. Simultaneously, the old forest in Sápmi has decreased due to commercial forestry and thus removed one of the main mitigation measures to fight the consequences and cope 
the consequences of climate change for the rangers. This has resulted in a massive loss of rangers, which are the vital, which is vital to culture, subsistence, and economy for the Sami ranger herding communities. Ranger herders are being forced to feed their herd with fodder, which is expensive and not economically viable in the long term. Um, this third um, point that I would like to raise is when you are creating NBS solution, it is remarkable the invisibility, again, unfortunately, of the perspectives and experiences of indigenous uh, people and how we can contribute within all the discussions and actions. Indigenous knowledge is already recognized within different fora and indigenous peoples must therefore be included in the discussion of any solutions within the framework of the EU. In this context, the European Green League deal should be revisited. But creating transformative positive change to slow global climate change and declining biodiversity now and for future generation is only possible through a human right-based approach built on climate justice. Climate justice needs to uh, kind of consist of everything we do from global to national, regional and local level. A right-based right approach is central to the effective development and implementation of any solutions where the full participation, respect and promotion of the rights of indigenous people is at the core. Recognizing the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a minimum. Only in a process that is inclusive, with all available types and sources of knowledge equally utilized and respected, can result in successful climate policy implementation based on NBS. In closing, I urge the EU decision makers at all levels to include the Sami people in finding the best possible solution for protecting the environment and our biodiversity based on a human right approach. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Elie Merite Omar. Thank you, Elie Merite Omar. Thank you for those advice and recommendation. I would like to give the floor now to Joanne Carling, who is a member of the caucus and member of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group for Sustainable Development in the Philippines. Joanne, you have the floor. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I will share the experience from the Philippines on the financialization of nature and also uh, reflect on the global issues and provide some recommendations. Uh, just to be blunt, uh, the financialization of, of nature has led to massive land grabbing and the destruction of an environment and the distortion of the real value of nature. So if we, if I say it's um, uh, land grabbing, this is by mining companies who are more interested in the golds and minerals over the use of the land for agriculture and other, and, and other uh, for sustainable livelihoods of, of communities. We see the uh, dam builders who are more interested in, in generating energy for profit rather than for the protection of the riverine system that supports ir uh, irrigation, livelihoods for people. Also lagging companies who look at the value of timber uh, rather than the trees supporting other, the, the you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, fa uh, fa fauna and fauna in the forest. So it dis distorts that interrelation, uh, uh, interdependent relations of the different aspects of nature when we start finance to, fi to commercialize, if I may say, the value of, of nature. And this is a very big problem for indigenous peoples because it's not only land grabbing that is leading to uh, uh, um, evictions, 
but it all is also resulting to the weakening of our self-governance, the weakening of our culture, the abuse of women, the further marginalization and, uh, and poverty for indigenous peoples. Uh, so so, so if, we, if we talk about financialization of nature, it's really a, a big problem for indigenous peoples because our, our values and our were, um, concepts of, 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 of reciprocity, of sustainability is completely ignored. Uh, so, so if if I if I if I want if I look into, for example, our experience on mining, uh, aside from the displacement and destruction of livelihood, it has also caused pollution, very uh, bad pollution of rivers because of the of the toxic waste from the mining, right? So that is already a, a big problem until now because the 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 the, the river is, is remains polluted, and then it also depletes the water source. And now the 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 mining communities, the the former mining communities, because the the mining has stopped after taking all the the gold, are very marginalized. So so that's that's uh, many call the resource curse where in indigenous territories, if you are rich in, 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 in minerals, you are subject to land grabbing. It's a curse that, that, that the power, those in power, those who have power, power will take your resources without regard to your land. And that is uh, a, a continuing uh, problem uh, till, till, till today. Now, how will this fit into what is now called a nature-based solution, right? So if we look at this issue, for example, that the, 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 the extractive industry, the particularly the, the fossil uh, industry, if they, they, they have already taken over a lot of indigenous lands and destroyed these lands, polluted these lands, and now, they also want to take over our forest and again displace us from our forest under a conservation scheme, the a fortress conservation scheme called nature-based solution because they want to, to uh, you know, as a carbon offset, which is, so at the end, in, we are caught between this extractive industry that is causing the, 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 the serious problem of carbon emission. And at the same time, they want to offset that by again, grabbing our, our forest. So where, where do we stand now as indigenous peoples? And yet, as others have pointed out, we are the ones who are actually having the, uh, the practice to conserve uh, mm. nature by the, by the fact that that the 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 that eighty percent of the biodiversity of the world are still in indigenous uh, territories. So um, as 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 others have have mentioned that if we are to uh, to provide solutions to, uh, to climate change, we need to involve, including in decision making, those that are actually supporting and conserving nature. And when we say we involve them in the decision making, the the the, the context should be at the at the uh, the uh, the respect for our rights, the respect for our dignity, the respect for our well being. And when we say respect for our rights, it's both legal recognition and also security of our uh, lands territories and resources because in many in my country the philippines there is actually legal recognition of our rights to our lands territories and resources but the mining companies are more powerful th than us that they can distort the legal recognition so that they can still take over 
uh, our, our lands to do their mining activity. So that means the legal framework should be consistent in respecting rights. So policy coherence to support indigenous people's rights over the economic interest of the few of groups with vested interest to even actually destroy the environment should uh, be avoided. So policy coherence is, 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 is important when, uh, when we uh, in addressing um, uh, the problem of climate change and putting human rights and rights holders at the center of decision uh, making. That means we also need to regulate the activities of corporations to ensure that they do uh, conduct uh, human rights due diligence, that they have policies for transparency, that they need to, uh, to provide information about their activities, about how they protect the environment, about how they respect human rights. Uh, they, they, they cannot anymore proceed with business as usual in, 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 that, uh, in that regard. And there's also a need to divest funds away from supporting the extractive industry that is causing the pollution, that is causing carbon emission and, and invest in community initiatives to protect the environment, to conserve the remaining biodiversity. So we need to divest from the destructive uh, corporations and invest in communities. And, and, and I, I hope that the, that, 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 um, the EU will, will, will put their money in this regard and ensure that all support to climate change solution is underpinned by human rights, by social equity, by accountability of those that are involved uh, in, in, in this, uh, in this um, actions. So, uh, so finally, I, I, I would just like to, to uh, again reiterate that, that uh, when we talk of nature-based uh, solutions, we need that, that this should not be interpreted for the vested interest of the few, uh, but it should, it, it should be uh, underpinned by ensuring justice, social equity, human rights, sustainability, and, uh, and maintaining our, our uh, reciprocal relations with nature and not isolate uh, people from nature because that is not going to, uh, to solve our problem of, of climate change. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Joanne. Thank you very much, Joanne. Joanne Carling, this is very interesting what you're sharing with us. But before we go to questions and answers, I would like to give the floor again to Joseph. Are you able to connect again? And are you able to complete your presentation? Are you still with us, Joseph? Yes, yes, I am still here. I am online, yes, I'm here. And I do apologize for that uh, problem. That's what happens with uh, technology, but it's still a good thing that we can hear you. Thank you very much. I was just about to conclude my presentation with my re specific recommendation. So what I was saying is I would like to to add my comments to all my counterparts across the world that it's very important that the international debate on climate change and on biodiversity is to be integrated and consider the concerns and the worries that we have at, uh, as indigenous people. And I was coming to the end of my presentation with an essential point to say that we cannot uh, 
draw the benefits from the conservation if the environment and the territories of our cities are not protected. We need to ensure the legal protection of our territories of life, well live uh, indigenous people and to have more specific measures in the form of uh, natural reserve, ecological and community based uh, areas and to guarantee and has been mentioned in several debates. And, in, and how can we ensure such an equity when it comes to those historical uh, efforts to protect the rights of the indigenous people is as important as uh, protecting biodiversity. And my last slide to conclude my presentation, if we can go to the last slide, please. Thank you very much. I was saying, so we need uh, a political and diplomatic support. I believe these kind of frameworks so are very appropriate when we hold negotiations, both during COP26 on climate or on the COP15 for biodiversity. We have some positions which are clearly defined and have to be highlighted and to ensure that our mindsets, our opinions is based on our traditional knowledge and uh, different ways of protecting protecting it and are faced with uh, difficulties. So we want all our positions, our views to be taken into account. And we do need a specific and sufficient financial support to strengthen, secure, and, and uh, enhance the management of governance and community. We do, need a we do need a very specific support in order to share the environmental benefits uh, in equal way. And I thank you again for giving me the floor and letting me complete my presentation. Here we go. Thank you very much, Joseph. You were able to conclude your presentation. Before we move on to the question and answers, as we are talking about indigenous people and uh, respecting the rights, I'm putting myself in the in the shoes of an indigenous people in any kind of environment, in a forest or anywhere else. And then I see a large company coming to where I live and they want to either extract minerals or as we've seen with extract, extraction companies, we do see it a lot in DRC, but also in Philippines and in other, other countries. But for this, which is quite new and in a way of offsetting GHG, which have been emitted by the rich countries in let's say in Europe, and they want to offset it with a forest or monoculture. What kind of tools would we need to really preserve and protect the voice of uh, indigenous people, because you said we have to be inclusive, i.e. you need to be associated in the decision-making process. So this has to be enshrined on paper so that any kind of new infrastructure anywhere in the world, which is potentially affecting a protected area or an area where biodiversity matters a lot, you need to have your rights guaranteed whilst being able to take part in the negotiations. Secondly, you say that when some money is given away, it has to be redistributed in a better way across the indigenous peoples because often they live in forests, but they don't seem to be associated to the funding process. And then we will have to preserve the customary rights and the land rights. I believe there is a whole set of recommendations that we will have to list down on things which cannot be done without. Because if you don't get protected and then you have a large company coming to settle on your, uh, on your territory with a lot of money backing them up, supporting them, according to me, you are not enough, you're not protected enough. So my question will be the one, 
what will be the three recommendations that you could share with us that could lead to something being enshrined in uh, in stone if you like that would be a way to enhance biodiversity and would be a, a factor to make sure you are protected yourselves i will now give the floor to ellen who will moderate the question and answers elena you have the floor as we are running a little bit late we had uh, 10 minutes uh, planned for the q and a session i would suggest that we keep that and that means it will uh, delay us a little bit for the coffee break and so on but i will start with the questions which seem to be the most popular ones a question for all speakers but also for joseph what is the real place in this new vision uh, based on nature-based solutions when it comes to traditional knowledge of indigenous people or how what, how do we do to try to capitalize on that knowledge as a cornerstone for the approach so maybe we could go in the order of the speakers john sorry Oh, hope can you can you hear us? Uh, Joseph, est-ce que tu es toujours avec nous? Oui, oui, je vous attends bien. Are you still here, Joseph? So maybe you can answer that question first, and then tell us what are your your thoughts. Okay. So traditional knowledge make up a good basis when it comes to protecting biodiversity and the forests. Those traditional knowledge, and if we want them to be involved in the decisions that will be made and give us also an opportunity to secure our situation in the territories where we live is because that traditional knowledge is on the territory in situ so when there are threats over those territories when there is a land grabbing of our territories and so on we don't we are not really able to highlight and protect those traditional knowledge so this is why we want to include that with nature, which is, I believe, a good uh, basis for our values. And you know, it's a territory that has to be protected. And this is the cornerstone, I believe, in the in discussing the nature-based solutions. This is uh, an important aspect, and we know that nature-based solutions are made of those traditional knowledge and we do try to maintain them to protect them and we want to encourage a debate also for the land tenure rights and our traditional knowledge which form the basis and the integrity of biodiversity so this is why we are fighting today to make sure that those traditional knowledge can be taken into account in the debates so nature-based solutions i can say that indigenous uh, people are a solution based uh, for nature. I also see, I also saw in the chat, what are you planning to do in DRC in relationship of, uh, in relation to securing those rights? I believe a lot of efforts have been deployed in our country and we've been advocating for indigenous people benefit from a specific uh, uh, legislation and protect their rights so that it can form a base for protecting our traditional territories and the rights to the land. So that goes beyond all the reforms that have been undertaken either in DRC when it comes to sectorial uh, reforms or land tenure rights and land tenure reforms. Uh, we need to take more into account the the integration the em embedding of the rights of indigenous people and and also include biodiversity and the securization of the forest thank you joseph 
you want to come in as well on this question? Hello? Yes, Joan, go ahead. Ah, okay. Yeah, no, I just 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 thought to Joseph that that uh, when we talk of of traditional knowledge, we uh, we we need to also protect the base of this traditional knowledge uh, and the, the 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 traditional knowledge holders. We are actually very alarmed now with so many deaths uh, of of traditional knowledge holders as victims of COVID, uh, and and this is really causing us a crisis. You know way uh so so what 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 we need to do as as well is one to 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 provide an enabling environment to ensure that the transfer of traditional knowledge to the younger and future generations because if we don't have that enabling environment that includes not only the protection of of, of rights but also the protection of the of of the youth of of of, of the the young people so that they don't leave their territories and it's instead they learn uh, the, the traditional knowledge and thereby they can continue uh, to, uh, to imbibe and practice this uh, traditional knowledge and pass it to the next uh, generation. So, so if we're talking of climate change mitigation and, and adaptation, as Joseph has mentioned, this uh, uh, traditional knowledge is critical. Uh, on, 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 on this, but, uh, and it's important to ensure that it, it is continuously practiced uh, by ensuring that the en enabling environment is provided. Thank you, Joan. I, is Ede Merete Oma still with us? And if so, would you like to come in on this question? Thank you. I am still Great, with Great. Wonderful. <laughs> no, I can echo what Joan and Joseph was saying. And in, in addition, I uh, want to say that, you know, building a knowledge platform where both types of knowledge, both a scientific knowledge base and an, an indigenous knowledge base is co-creating, you know, new knowledge. It's, it's important to acknowledge. And in a, such a context, um, it would be beneficial to um, see how the EU research programs can be primed. So um, the program reflects this needs um, in, a, in a better manner. I think that could also strengthen uh, the idea and, and the thinking around uh, nature-based solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for panelists. What I would like in the to, to suggest in the interest of time is that uh, you please join us on the QA Q and A section uh, of the discussion. Uh, there are more questions, uh, I believe, that are addressed to you, and uh, to potentially uh, answer these questions in writing if you have the time. Um, and on that note, I would like to pass over to Michelle uh, to take us into the next section. Thank you, Elena. So we are going to start with panel three. And I guess the break is uh, cancelled. So will nature-based solutions, will they continue the status quo? For that panel, you cannot see me. I apologize for that. Sorry. Here we go. So what I was saying is we are going to proceed to panel three related to will nature-based solutions continue the status quo and for that panel we have invited members of the private sector because they have already designed some plans either um, total or petrol companies and in this case we invited nestle who will share with us on what is corporate communications when it comes to nature-based solutions. We will also have Mark Sadler, who is a manager of the Climate Funds Management Unit at the World Bank. And then we have Brice Bummer, Climate and Environment Lead for Transparency International. So both companies and NGOs. And uh, firstly, Mark, uh, 
Van, Van de Vatere, VP Corporate Communication and ASG Engagement for NSLA. Emina, you have the floor, and how do you approach that solution, that your base solutions? Thank you. And, and thank you uh, uh, to the organizers. I, I will take the speech in, uh, in English. Um, so basically what I would like to uh, talk about, and I will see if I can share the screen. If not, uh, we, can, uh, we can also handle in a different way. Let me share and make it bigger here. I hope uh, you see. So what is um, uh, very important uh, in my view is to say, and, and just to reconfirm, I think the IPPC, IPCC report is very clear. Land use is a, a major uh, contributor of uh, emissions. Um, what we have also seen through a report of the World Benchmarking Alliance that you might know is that basically not enough companies are, are uh, acting in our sector, in the land use uh, sector. Uh, only 26 out of 350 of the largest food and drink companies are acting towards this net zero, uh, which is net zero is fully insetting, uh, by the way, uh, and covering our whole scope, uh, including technically speaking, also what we call this scope three, which is outside our uh, direct control, uh, including the forests, for example, in our supply chains. So Nestle is one of the, the 26 companies that is committed to this net zero with milestones already very shortly, 20% reduction by 2025 of emissions, um, half by 2030. Um, if you look uh, basically at our um, sourcing, uh, you see their percentages, and, and you see um, that, um, in essence, I will try to remove this here, 70% um, of what uh, is our emissions is basically coming from uh, sourcing and the ingredients, and you see a big part is also from forest. You see the numbers there on the, on the graphic. So... Um, more than 10 years ago, we, we came up with a commitment to say no more deforestation for our key commodities. We are now at uh, 990 90% of deforestation free. We should be 100% deforestation free end of next year. But now is also the time to close the, the gap that is still there, but also to go beyond and uh, to uh, do what we have been discussing in the previous sessions to restore, conserve also uh, the forest. What we learned in those uh, 10 years is basically that it will not work if we will just look at our own supply chain, huh? because that's, that's really not enough. Uh, we need to work it out in the whole landscape. Huh? So not only all our farmers, let's say, there and, and the farmers who are supplying us. Huh? And this means absolutely working in close uh, relationship with the local uh, communities. Uh, and that is really a must. And this is what we call for being forest positive, um, working on biodiversity, climate, but also with the communities, with the indigenous people as well, who, who are really, let's say, the guardians of, of all of this. Um, uh, in the middle of uh, this journey, securing the land rights of the local communities is key huh? and also we need to make sure uh, because that is key to basically develop and implement these nature-based solutions um, that we were talking agroforestry, forest conservation, restoration programs. Huh? How we operationalize that, um, in essence, and here you see some of the numbers I can share afterwards where we are on deforestation free, but how we do this basically is through our responsible sourcing um, guideline or, or uh, standard. Basically, it's not a guideline. It's mandatory for all our suppliers and, and their suppliers. And you see immediately that there are elements which have to do with uh, the planet, let's say, the, uh, everything which has to do with emissions and uh, biodiversity, but also the social aspect. Huh? Um, and very clearly, the legal right to use the land, uh, suppliers should demonstrate that, but also evidence of free, prior, and informed consent of local and indigenous people. Huh? So that is really part of our uh, standard there, and only then we are basically uh, working with our uh, suppliers and continue to work. Because if we see that there is an issue, 
uh, with one of our suppliers, we are not just going to stop working with them immediately. We suspend and we engage. We look at, okay, what, what we can improve so that they can re-enter as fast as possible. And that's really our approach of our company. We don't want basically to cut out people and run away. And then somebody else comes and who maybe doesn't care about what is on this slide. Huh? Uh, so we want to transform over time so that we really can scale up this forest positive strategy with nature-based solutions part of this. I've brought just two examples of how concretely we work. I think from the cocoa supply chain that we are very active in, in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, we work with the government there, with local uh, players, the farmers, the communities, and, and, and also with women organizations, very important there. Because our cocoa farmers are at the frontiers of this um, reserve, and actually 80% of them see that maybe this Cavalli forest that we are talking about uh, is maybe an opportunity to grow further their, their cocoa fields and their cocoa uh, incomes ultimately. But we work with them to make sure they are not considering this. Huh? And, and they are really finding different incomes for their family in a different way. So basically, we look at the landscape, we look at the Cavalli, we look with the government, and basically we say, here is the place to cultivate cocoa, here is the place to conserve um, uh, the, the, their, the, the forest, the biodiversity linked with it, and, and so on. So that's really important, working locally, working in the landscape, not only in the supply chain. Basically the same thing on the right hand side in, in Indonesia, where we also work with the local people, lots of training as well on alternative uh, incomes for farmers and, and transition pathways. Huh? So this brings me to the, the last thing I would like to say, what do we expect uh, from the EU? I think a couple of things has been said before. Very important is this due diligence, and, and as a Nestle, we believe that mandatory due diligence on human rights and also on environmental topics is the right way to do. It needs to be done in the proportionate way. We are doing this in a voluntary way for years already, but now it should be for everybody in the supply chain, uh, for sure. Then I think we need to work, and Europe needs to work also in bilaterals with producer countries, maybe starting where we have a very big impact, like on cocoa, that's, that's very clear. Not just development support and things like that, but really helping with a, with a focus on planning, governance, uh, all these kind of, of things. Cooperation and dialogue, obviously, with everyone. Um, also on, the, on other demand side countries that they are doing, like Europe, is, is, is really uh, in mindset uh, doing, and the finance sector, obviously, uh, as well. You see here the four things I was just discussing. But finally, and I repeat, nature-based solutions for us are certainly very important, and we believe they have a key role to play in cutting emissions or, or putting more or having uh, keep restore the biodiversity. But it needs to be done with all of us, with the support of the EU, uh, for sure. But notably, at the heart of it are the people and the communities. And if we don't work with them, we don't unlock the potential of nature-based solutions, and we will not ultimately find uh, the solution. And I hope that that point was made uh, clear enough. And thank you. Merci, merci, Monsieur Van der Wetter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Van der Wetter. Uh, I would, before we, before I give the floor to the next speaker, I would like you to think about a question. Would, would Nestle be in favor? Because I saw how you function, uh, how you operate in Ghana, where you helped uh, uh, planting uh, tree species to increase the biodiversity in the forest. But the issue is that more you plant uh, cocoa trees and more you contribute to deforestation. Uh, would you be ready to finance uh, from a fund to be defined, uh, maybe managed by the EU, to help the populations to value their traditional knowledge? 
because uh, there's been a proposal which I find interesting. Why does the private sector not participate? I will ask you that later. Now, I'm going to give the floor to Mark Sadler, who is in charge of the unit management of uh, climate changes of the World Bank. How does the World Bank help finance solutions, nature-based solutions, which do not um, come in under compensation or offsetting, uh, some sort of offsetting, which would change the ecosystem, but not automatically to go to equivalent ecosystems. The floor is yours, Mr. Sadler. Thanks very much. Uh, hopefully the uh, microphone is working. Oui, Excellent. très bien. Good. On vous entend et on vous voit. We can see you and hear you. Perfect. Excellent. Technology has not been my friend so far this morning. It's been it's been a long morning. Uh, look, huge thanks uh, for the opportunity to uh, to come and talk today. Um, I decided not to actually do a presentation because it's such uh, you know a broad and large uh, topic. It's very difficult to to condense that into a, a small number of slides. Um, yeah, clearly, the conversation today relates to what uh, is an amazing opportunity that is that is before us at the moment. There, the level of interest in investing in landscapes, nature, forestry uh, has increased dramatically uh, in the past five years specifically. Uh, and not only is there you know, commercial interest, there is also interest that is clearly coming from ministries of finance in, in our client countries. So things are really coming together. The challenge we've had for many years is actually uh, bringing people to, to see and understand that, that landscapes and forestry are actually an active and contributing part of the economy. Uh, and so that's, that, that's huge progress and something that I think we should all be super happy about. Um, at the same time, I think it is clear that the regulatory side is also moving. And that's a hugely positive sign. So not only do we have the task force uh, on, on climate risk, it's called the TCFD, we now have the TNFD, which of course is about uh, nature related uh, financial disclosures. And so this starts to really raise the issue uh, and complexity, but the importance of uh, viewing landscapes and nature as part of uh, not only the productive assets, but the, 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 the potential negative side uh, of exposure to, to that sector. But what that, of course, then it engenders and what it results in is an increased uh, importance and focus of especially financiers, but, but also ministries of finance on the role of nature I and mean, one, one thing that the bank has worked on for for many years and we're really seeing a, a dramatic uh, uptake now is around natural capital and assessing the value of natural capital uh, if we look at a, a number of countries uh, what you can clearly see is that they have achieved economic growth over the past 10 to 20 years by essentially mining their natural capital by using their natural resources, uh, which uh, and not using them in a regenerative way, so and that has a, a, an impact. And so, one of the uh, one of these approaches around nat natural capital valuations is really to be able to show ministries of finance what those assets, what that natural capital is actually worth to the country, and then uh, work with them to to actually implement policies and investment planning that clearly A, values it, but B, uh, moves it to a sustainable usage as opposed to uh, um, non-sustainable. So the, these are huge changes in, in the, I'll use the word, landscape uh, of what we're seeing. But within that, of course, uh, there are challenges. And one of the particular challenges, and I think you know, this is something we'll talk about uh, in the next panel, uh, is 
how do we ensure that the benefits that are coming from these opportunities actually flow to those people uh, who are working uh, and living on these landscapes or in these landscapes and, and forests? And especially how are we reaching out and ensuring that the most vulnerable and that the least represented have an equitable role in a sharing of those proceeds, but equally, and if not more importantly, uh, the planning and the implementation of these programs. Uh, and you, I just, your, your, your last comment, and in actual fact, sort of touched on one of those major issues, right? Which is uh, the use of uh, local knowledge, historical approaches. Uh, what we find is that you know, um, large scale uh, monoculture has not clearly uh, been necessarily the most sustainable uh, approach for food systems and increasingly uh, sus more sustainable approaches and especially ones that, that, uh, that, that focus on adaptation and resilience are actually increasingly bringing in uh, local approaches, local knowledges, local species uh, to, to, to actually bring the resilience uh, because you know a one size fits all monoculture won't actually doesn't doesn't get you where you need to go. So we can see what the opportunities are. I think it's very clear what the risks are. Um, at the bank, you know, approaches to the risk management, but I mean, we we don't look at like uh, uh, as risk management. We actually look at it as as uh, as being a, you know an integrated and inclusive approach to development, of course, comes A, through the way that we you know, design and implement the projects, but secondly, through uh, our safeguards and how we actually work with indigenous peoples and local communities, how we uh, go about stakeholder consultations um, in the space that relates to climate finance and specifically carbon, finance, which I think is part of the focus, especially it comes up in, in, in that next panel to touch upon. You know, one of the things that we really highlight as being critical is the existence of benefit sharing plans. So having an ex ante agreement on who will share in the, the financial benefits and the non-financial benefits that flow from these carbon finance projects. And one of the biggest areas of interest that we see uh, in voluntary carbon markets, but also in compliance markets, is uh, the demand for uh, carbon assets that relate to nature-based solutions. Um, and for us, therefore, the, the cornerstone of any of these agreements uh, and carbon programs is the existence of what we call a benefit sharing plan. And then supporting those uh, communities, indigenous peoples, local communities, uh, vulnerable populations, to A, be part of that discussion and part of the establishment of the benefit sharing plan, to monitor, to ensure that they receive the monies, uh, that, you know, to, to actually make sure the money flows where it said it was supposed to flow. And then the support to those communities uh, to A, assist them and support them in planning in what they want to do with those uh, with those benefits, how they're going to manage and, and govern them, and how they how they can maximize their benefit. And one of the things that we've traditionally seen is there's sort of a focus on, well, yes, these benefits need, need to flow, but then we're also dealing with, uh, you know, we'll pick on one specifically, some very non, or some very, very traditional societies that have um, so it's a very clear governance structures about societal interaction, but those governance structures have never actually become involved in issues such as how, how do we share money as a community? And so that raises uh, a, a whole host of issues which these communities have never dealt with before. And so uh, we have standalone programs that then work with those communities to assist and help and support them to think those things through for them to identify how they would want to go about doing that and then to support them to do that as well. So yes, make sure that there's a clear pathway for money to flow to these uh, communities that are involved, 
but then also support those communities to ensure that they can continue to um, participate in the sharing of those benefits, but also to raise their voices in, in further programs and, and programming. So I'll, I'll leave it there. It's a huge topic, obviously. So I'm very happy to be here. Merci. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark Sadler. <coughs> I'm going to give the floor to Brice Bromer, who is in charge of climate and environment at uh, Transparency International. So it's an NGO. The floor is yours, uh, Brice. Thank you, Michel. Thank you to all the participants and all the speakers so far. Donc, uh, si vous um, the presentation in English. Um, and um, what I wanted to say, thank you. Um, just for, for those uh, not familiar with uh, Transparency International, so we are indeed um, an NGO and, and a global movement, in fact, uh, because we are present in about 100 uh, countries um, that are, however, independent chapters, um, so local um, NGOs. And we are focusing on, on on fighting corruption. So I would like here that you would see that I think there is a lot of topics that have been already touched upon, but I would like to focus on that issue um, of governance, good governance and, and corruption and, and what are the links um, as well and, and why is it uh, important. Um, so I, I, I don't have a specific uh, definition of, of my two best solutions, but uh, but I think, um, as it has been said, I mean, I would I would really align with the views of, of many speakers, especially Ele and, and John, um, to uh, in that 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 it seems there are different concepts in there, and and you know uh, I think everyone will say that uh, in this title everything sounds positive. No, it's solutions, it's nature based. So how could we? Be against that, but uh, but I think the the devil is in the details. So so we need to make sure that this works, and that this works differently from uh, you know how we've been implementing so-called solutions so far. Um, and uh, I think in our views, the problem is that uh, underlying the the failure, so to speak, of fighting climate change and and fighting real solutions um, is corruption uh, because it has been a vehicle. Um, and a key driver of environmental destruction, um, but also of climate change and, and human rights abuses. Um, so yeah, the slides that you have uh, now in, in front of you is, uh, you might have seen this, um, this map already, it's what we call the Corruption Perception Index, um, that shows the level of perceived corruption in the public sector. So there is a lot of, of caveat to that, to that, and we can discuss more you know, the, the difficulty also of, of measuring corruption and, and the different form of corruption as well. Um, but what I wanted to say here is just <clears throat> as, a, as why it is important to look at those issues and, and, and um, why it has been also uh, underlooked so far is that it, it is recognized that, you know, 20 to 40% of development assistance, for example, is lost uh, and it all is stolen uh, by corruption. And this is something that um, that we kind of all know, but that that is difficult to tackle, or at least there's there is very little will to tackle as well. And and this this corruption and, and the different forms of corruption, because we we define corruption as the abuse of interested power for private gain. So it's not only about monetary aspects, but it can be, you know, um, undue influence, for example. So one form of lobbying that shouldn't be um, acceptable. And, and the problem with that um, corruption or with some of the forms of corruption is that it, it exacerbates also the current display. I think we talked about it from the environmental and also social damage from the global north to the global south. So there is also, um, in the views, um, a problem with climate change that if we don't tackle it, it's also like a responsibility that the current generation don't take. So a form of corruption as well that is more kind of uh, comprehensive, so to speak. Um, so here you see on the map that um, there are, um, well, everywhere corruption first, uh, but also if you compare this map with the map of climate vulnerability, you will see 
a good alignment, which is not a good uh, news when it comes to to making climate finance efficient, for example. And that means that there is a lot of risks um, for a climate project and, and nature based solutions in particular. If we go to the next slide, and, and here we we kind of going a bit more um, towards um, other type of risks as well that are, for example, linked to the fact that some of, the, of this climate finance and some of those natural based solutions are, are new and um, are kind of flowing through bodies that are uh, untested and, and new and complex. And this, in our views, um, makes, makes it um, more vulnerable to, uh, to corruption. And if you look at the sectors, for example, um, we, we talked a lot, I think, and, and I will come a bit closer later in the presentation about the forestry sector. And here we know that you know, between 50 to 90% of um, the forestry in key producer to people countries is illegal and, and is being laundered by the pulp and paper industries and, and often going through shell companies. So you know, this is also a topic that, um, that is quite high in the news uh, lately um, and for some years now, but again, I think as a collective, we fail to really tackle um, those issues. And another aspect of, of the nature based solutions that has been um, discussed already today is the carbon markets or compensation. Those have been also, um, or, or have been famous for being prone to corruption um, with issues of environmental integrity, of double counting, for example, um, and this will be um, quite important for the negotiations at the coming uh, COP26. If you go to the next slide, um, here I wanted to give you some examples of uh, what we mean by uh, corruption in climate action or in, in NBS. Um, <clears throat> on the left side, you have some examples that are more um, about mitigation measures and on the right side, more about adaptation. And you will see that it can be um, yeah, different type of, um, of corruption. So for example, one of it is conflict of interest um, or uh, bribes. Um, and then um, you will see that it that can have also um, different types of impact. So it could be that it will uh, result, this type of corruption will um, result in, um, for example, less um, decrease in the carbon emissions. But the problem, or the even more problematic part, is that it could even increase emissions. Or as we've heard uh, before today, it could also create um, environmental or social damage, uh, if not done properly. Uh, if we go to the next slide, and this is one of the examples of, you know, the, the extreme of it, and, and I think it has been also um, mentioned before, is that if the solutions are not um, implemented properly, this can uh, result even in, in murders. And here again, um, you can see that the, the whole, um, at different times of, of those murders or, um, or those threats to environmental defenders, for example, corruption is there. And corruption is there to allow those threats to happen or allow impunity. Um, which means that, you know, very few, um, and here you have on the screen, only 10% of the murders um, of environmental defenders result in conviction. And this is also um, clearly because of corruption. Uh, in the next slide, uh, you can see, uh, again, a couple of more uh, concrete examples from different countries. Um, I just wanted to mention, for example, the one in the Maldives, um, and also say that, and, and I will come to that later in the presentation, that we can do something about it and, and we should you know, tackle these issues um, and, and give them more importance. Um, and here in the Maldives, it was an example of poor consultation um, and also weakened uh, environmental impact assessments uh, for, for in investments, which are uh, something that is key and which relates there also uh, of the strengths of the process and the independence of those bodies in charge of the environmental um, impact assessment in that case. Um, if you go to the next slide, 
Um, this is um, coming from um, a study that we did looking at different um, bodies in charge of um, climate finance, uh, international funds. So the most, um, the famous one would be the Green Climate Fund that you probably heard of, but there is also one that is called the Central African Forest Initiative. Um, and what we did there was that uh, we looked at what are the policies in terms of transparency, of accountability, of, of fighting corruption, and, and how those policies could be strengthened. Um, and there, one key aspect in, in the specific case of, um, of the Central African Forest Initiative was uh, how to avoid conflict of interest and how to avoid conflicts of interest of um, member um, of the board deciding on where the investments will be done. Um, next, if we go to the next slide, and um, I wanted to, to present you um, a study that will be released um, in the next uh, days and weeks um, by partners of Transparency International and FERN. And there we wanted to look at those intersections of climate finance, but especially looking at forest um, finance and um, hey, looking at questions of governance and what are the implications of the governments, the governance frameworks on communities, on indigenous peoples. So looking at um, both the global level or, or the, the international flows of uh, that forest finance, but also zooming in uh, six countries that you have on the screen and looking at how the different um, governance arrangements um, have an impact um, on communities, on the way um, forest finance is being uh, used, um, and how, also how to, to reinforce those uh, governance arrangements in, in those uh, specific countries. If we go to the next slides, you have here like a screenshot of the main um, findings of the report. So um, first, some, um, some numbers. So you see that forest climate finance is, is is quite a big share, an important share of the total climate finance that of course is still uh, not enough. Um, but you would see that uh, unfortunately what we noticed, what we saw is that the, um, the activities and mostly the readiness activities or the projects that have been implemented um, under that forest um, climate uh, framework have been um, limited in terms of contributions to um, improvements um, of civil society participations in, in those mechanisms. Um, there has been some, some concerns uh, raised um, in uh, pointing to different solutions, including Red Plus programs, for example, specifically um, to land expropriation and also uh, further marginalization of some groups, um, including women and ind indigenous peoples. Um, a previous study also showed that um, two thirds uh, of people asked, um, it was for the Africa, African uh, barometer, um, indicated that they saw that the rich person would be very likely to get away with registering land not belonging to them, which is uh, very concerning when we when we look at the, those investments and, and how easy it's, uh, it can be to to grab land still. Um, the last uh, next slide, um, you will see some of the recommendations that we put in that report and that are also aligned with um, usually the recommendations that we made we make to on how to tackle um, those corruption issues. Uh, the first one um, comes probably as no surprise, it's greater transparency. They still a lot that is unclear. Um, we discussed that for, for nature-based solutions, but, but you know, when it comes to, to defining um, even what is climate finance, there is not a clear agreed definition um, by all parties. So that's something that of course makes it difficult to follow the money, to make to, to assess if that money was used properly, um, and even more so um, assess the impact of it. Uh, we are very far from from doing that to do that, uh, and the main bodies uh, have um, are not doing it or are not doing it. In indigenous groups. Um, here, for example, in the past, have 
have shown creating the space for, for conversation has been uh, quite useful. Um, the third one is around the, um, the importance of having independent um, oversight. I think the uh, Mark, the previous speaker, also spoke about it and, and you know how it is important to have that uh, part of, the, of how those frameworks are um, created. Um, and also linked to that, I just wanted to say that in our views, um, two features are key. On one side is redress mechanism, compliance mechanism, and on the other side is a whistleblower uh, protection uh, that can really uh, help with the situation of environmental defenders. Um, and I think, as, as we heard before from some speakers, those solutions are, yes, often known and also often existing on paper, but only on paper. So we noticed, for example, in the case of Red Plus that in many countries, including, uh, for example, DRC, which is one of the countries more almost advanced when it comes to Red Plus, compliant mechanism was supposed to exist, you know, at the beginning or even before um, Red Plus can be can be start starting implementation. Um, but years and years after, there is still no complaint mechanism. So it's only now these days that the country is working on uh, a complaint mechanism, uh, not saying that you know it's it's accessible and it fit, it's uh, has all the features necessary to work. Um, so no, number four would be uh, land rights. I think uh, I talked about it before and, and also um, several speakers did. Um, and the last one would be around uh, how this international um, forest climate uh, finance in that case uh, should be scaled up, uh, but in a very equitable and inclusive manner that also would bring together different synergies uh, between that specific forest finance, but also other streams and other uh, financial flows. So um, if you go to the next slide, <laughs> that's over. Just, just to say that, yeah, we uh, don't hesitate to, to contact us. And, uh, and we are um, not only about to publish the study that I mentioned, the main findings now, but also trying to do um, a world atlas of, of those cases of corruption uh, and climate corruption and forest um, finance corruption to see, to grasp a bit more uh, what are the issues and, and what can be some of the solutions. Thank you very much. Merci, uh, Brice. Thank you, Brice. Uh, Brice Bummer, who you insisted on the corruption aspect. I will then give the floor to Helena, but there was one aspect that we didn't approach, the zero net emission, on which large companies or taking advantage and say zero net emissions by 2050, let's say, as per the climate agreement. But what does it mean? Does it mean that somehow they can continue emitting, but they offset with planting new trees that they can do both in Europe, but also in developing countries, in a lot of the places where the purchase of land is uh, a lot uh, cheaper. And as we have the representative for Nestle Rivers, I looked at the ambition was to compensate 13 million tons of uh, GHG based on natural nature based solutions. That would mean that we should look at this with uh, planting trees on 4.4 million hectares of land every year. So you can see here that they can claim net zero emission by 2050, when it, it means 4.4 million hectares of land planted every year. So this is why I believe that nature-based solutions can lead us to be very skeptical. I mean, I'm talking about Nestle, but I have the numbers for any uh, energy company in Italy, 8.1 million hectares of land planted in Africa if they want to offset that. We didn't really talk about it, which I would like us to address. A second point is for Mark Sadler. You are a manager for Climate Funds Management Unit, Climate Funds Management Unit at the World Bank. So when you have projects 
or these done with a condition some conditions that some of them you mentioned the participation of indigenous people or the fact that there are benefits that should be coming back to the indigenous people you didn't really talk you didn't talk at all about the conditions for granting such fund by the world bank on such and on accessing those climate funds because Brice Bummer is talking about corruption is that one of the conditions for granting such uh, such finance i would like those points to be discussed because that that point about zero net emissions by 2050 we can see that the companies are exploiting it but there are some counter some compensation aspect that goes against it thank you thank you i will uh, be you are raising actually net zero there is no offsetting so no offsetting this, this is under uh, auspicious of the science-based target initiative, and it defines very well it should be in setting. So what it means is that we will use um, these natural-based solutions in our supply chain, and we are doing this in several ways. One of the ways can be with the farmers who are supplying to us, in applying regenerative uh, agricultural practices. So crop rotation, uh, all these kind of things that, that are well known. Uh, then there is indeed a part which has to do with forest and reforestation or reforested uh, degraded forest land or re-wetting. But this is always closely connected with the landscape where our supply chain is. For example, uh, the example I gave on the Cavalli in, um, in um, Côte d'Ivoire, huh? uh, what is happening there is that we really look together with not only the farmers, but also the communities around and the indigenous people, okay, and the government, what needs to be done here? What needs to be done for the farmer? Uh, for example, in the cocoa um, uh, fields, they can add, and you have seen it probably in Ghana as well, you can add uh, the shadow trees. These are part of it because actually they help the farmer to, to be more productive. But at the same time, we are also looking with the government and the local people what can be done more to protect and maybe to restore parts that are close to our cocoa farmers uh, to restore these, uh, th these forests. So that is very important. There is no offsetting. In net zero, there is no offsetting. The, uh, I, I can assure you. Huh? Uh, and this is controlled on a daily, on a, a yearly basis. There is a report uh, on that. And we really um, will make sure this is not happening. So it's not outside of our, our uh, supply chains. And there is clear targets as well. It's not only by 2050 net okay. zero, but it's already minus 20% in our supply chain by 2025 and half by 2030. So it's really also short term actions and in setting. That's really very important. And, and I would like to stress that because I agree with you, if it would be offsetting, this maybe offsetting might be good, but if it is done, it needs to be do, done locally with the local people in it, not the necessary, not the monocultures, and the, it needs to be really validated very, very strongly. But for us, it's all about our focus is in setting because we want to change what we have a direct control on. So that's that's really important. Mais merci de cette réponse. Thank you for this answer. Mr. Mark Sadler, what are the conditions to uh, get your loans and your help, your, your fund? Mark? So, I mean, all the funds that, that come from uh, the climate finance side, which isn't necessarily the, the World Bank balance sheet, are covered by World Bank safeguards. So that's uh, all, all of those issues that you, that you are raising are covered uh, under our environmental and social framework. And not only is that preconditions to be able to, 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 to access the money, but it's also uh, conditions that set out how we will then continue to supervise during implementation of the projects and the finance flows. Um, you know, and, and as part of that, 
you know, with all the projects that we do, and especially, when, you know, for example, on the the um, the Red Plus side, you know, you're setting up GRMs, you know, grievance uh, redress mechanisms, uh, and also ensuring that the infrastructure is there to enable local populations to be able to, um, for want of a better word, complain, to uh, raise with independent third party, we have third party monitoring uh, uh, of these activities, so that it's very easy for anyone to flag any of the issues that you're specifically talking about. So that's just part of the infrastructure about uh, how we work, um, you know, as I agree with Brees, you know, this is a huge challenge it's been a challenge for for many decades it, it's something that um you know people sort of complain and notice that the world bank takes too long to do things but part of part of that is the the amount of time and supervision and due diligence that's required in not only uh, identifying these projects and putting them together and ensuring that you have broad stakeholder engagement etc but then the supervision of it um, and that is just part, part of the DNA uh, of what we do. On the zero offsets, which you raised, I mean, this is something, you know, I noticed the head of Greenpeace raised this uh, the other day. I think we do need to be very, very careful here. And there was one question that was in the chat room about, well, OK, where, where do these offsets actually relate to NDCs? Uh, and, and so there is going to, to need to be, I think, a very clear accounting for what these carbon assets are, where they came from, how they relate to the NDC, who shares in the benefits of them, and who is monitoring and who is uh, able to provide uh, support as it relates to these safeguard issues. And you know, we've got a very large Red Plus program. It took us, you know, fifteen years or more to actually put it in place, but they're now finally. Uh, sign the agreements uh, and the money will start to flow. Uh, but the you know, ensuring this is a very, very complex space that involves a lot of marginalized people. And, and a lot of the carbon offset business was really built around solar panels and renewable energy. And those were relatively site specific. Um, and involved companies and businesses, and there weren't a broad group of stakeholders. And so that was never really taken into any of those original uh, Kyoto Protocol CDM type projects. There are requirements there, uh, but once you get into the nature-based space, uh, you know, people chop down trees, people live in these, you know, the communities live in these forests and they're highly marginalized. And so the, the bar on the safeguard side is much higher than it has been for these traditional carbon offsetting programs. And we, we talk uh, you know, to, to a lot of stakeholders on the ground and the big companies that are interested in the offsets. And, and the one thing that we you know, spend a lot of time pointing out is that once you're involved in this nature-based space, this is a lot more complex. And the safeguards and the ensuring there is equitable sharing uh, of the proceeds, but also protection of rights. I noticed some comments there. You know, many years ago, there was this concept called climate smart agriculture, and there was a lot of pushback against it by NGOs and CSOs because there was a real concern that we would end up with land grabbing if the value of the carbon in the soil uh, became high because a lot of these people actually don't have land rights. They don't have land tenure. And again, in setting up these programs, you have to ensure that A, the agreements are in place, that it's clear who's going to share what, but secondly, that you then make sure that happens. And quite often what we find is that, yes, there's some discussion at the front end, but then it's not implemented. And so, you know, even if it's, you know, our job is to, to supervise what we do, but third party monitoring, bringing in third party organizations who are totally independent on some of these your voluntary schemes would start to get the a the implementation uh, assured in a much better way, but also increase this issue of transparency, um, because otherwise we're going to have a lot of offsets that you know really struggle with environmental integrity, double selling, and and all, all of these other issues that are out there. So um, 
sorry, you asked for a short answer, but it's 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 such a complex space. But it's one that if we get it right, there is the potential uh, during this transition period as we move to net zero. We can't change all the companies overnight, and there is a phenomenal opportunity for a large amounts of finance to flow to developing countries on an equitable and transparent basis that will really benefit the lives of the poorest and the, mo uh, and the most vulnerable. But that's really hard work to ensure that happens in the right way. Merci de cette réponse. Maintenant, je passe le relais. Thank you for your answer. I will now give the floor to Helena. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the speakers. We have had a lot of questions uh, submitted in the chat, and I would like to thank you, uh, Bart, Mark, and Brice, for uh, taking part in that Q&A session. I know, Mark, you are already involved with some of the attendees in the chat box. Uh, to do with a case in the Philippines, uh, Bart, I will let you um, answer that question maybe directly. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna read out uh, maybe I'm gonna start with one question on corruption. Uh, maybe for you, Brice, um, concernant la corruption au niveau étatique, ne pensez-vous pas when it comes to state corruption, do you not think that the territorial uh, scale could be an interesting alternative in order to receive the funds and being able to manage them conjointly with the local communities? Uh, thanks, Elena. Uh, yeah, I think I mean. I think unfortunately corruption is um, or can um, can be seen at um, all levels and, and everywhere as well like it's not uh, it's not only um, a problem in you know in some countries and not in others uh, unfortunately we see different types of corruption um, in different countries in different sectors etc so this is why I, I insisted a bit on that also in my presentation of course it can um, I mean, I think you have to to implement the solutions indeed at the at the local level and as close as possible to people. Um, and also, if that's visible to them and understandable to them, and if you have, um, as Mark was saying, for example, independent uh, third party monitoring the, those projects or those investments or evaluating the impacts of those investments, then that will decrease the level of corruption. We, we can't, um, I mean, that, that would be the goal to be uh, zero corruption as well. And, and, you know, the Green Climate Fund, for example, committed to that. Uh, but this is a goal, no? In practice, the, we are, we, we are and, and we will be uh, always um, away from that. Um, but I think uh, we need to have, do, I think if we look at how to do things now, I think it's just, whatever it's called, if it's called nature-based solutions or, or whatever solution we are looking at, we need to do things differently um, because until now it hasn't been working up to the level um, that we need to be at, you know, whereas it is the, the flows um, of, of finance that are available, whereas it is the, the actors that are uh, mobilized, where it is the impact that it has. So, and, and the way, and how to do it means doing it with people on the ground. So, so yeah, it can be interesting to look more at um, also, for example, what is called direct access. So, so really looking, even if it's at national level, that some institutions or local regional institutions can access um, those, this funding. Um, of course, respecting the safeguards, but you know, the problem is that even with very strong or, or at least um, strong reputation institutions, um, we've seen also problems in implementing the safeguards. So when it comes to, for example, whistleblower protection, we've seen recently some, some whistleblowers um, in um, blow, blowing the whistle on corruption in climate projects in Russia, for example, recently. Um, but years and years and years after those projects have been implemented, there is still no solution. And this is involving institutions like UNDP. Uh, so it's not a small uh, local um, organization, you know, that, that we could say would have more difficulty complying with some of the safeguards. So I think we shouldn't assume that um, that it's easier for, for big institutions. And we need to do, when I say we need to do things differently, is that 
it's we've seen also how sometimes those investments are made you know from a different country for example or projects are designed from uh, like very far away from the ground and and this is um this is this creates different problems including uh mismanagement including corruption including um non-efficient uh and and not um and projects not beneficial for people and and most of the time for the environment as well thank you Brice. um thank you for this answer i'm going to again in don't have that much time, but I'm going to now um, ask a question to Mark. Um, Mark, there's a question for you. Um, does Mark think that the TCFT and TNFT, don't you love all the acronyms that we have in this sector, um, adequately account for human rights and social impacts? And what can be done to strengthen the recognition of human rights risk um, within these frameworks? Or do we need a separate human rights-based framework for NBS and natural capital? So uh, at the moment, I can't, I'm, try, I'm trying to actually remember to give you a factual answer. I don't think that they actually uh, uh, NFT and the, the TCFT uh, because both of these are instruments which are about assessing risk as it relates to climate and risk as it relates to to nature. So I don't think they're in there. Um, uh, uh, as it relates to you know, human rights, I mean, speaking from the development side, you know, the issue that we have to do here is not just about ensuring that we're applying the safeguards, but it's, it's one of the other questions that's there, which is the earliest engagement possible with these communities in the process. I mean, un under the FCPF, which is the, the big red plus forest fund that, that we manage, you know, there was a specific dedicated program that was about engaging Indigenous peoples, uh, local communities and CSOs and building their capacity so they could be part of A, the design and B, the structuring and then C, the, the benefit sharing. Um, and I guess the question becomes or the importance becomes, you know, there's this sort of safeguarding, making sure that things don't go wrong. Uh, which is critical and important, and that's generally the thing that gets the most attention. But the thing that I don't think gets enough attention is this uh, ensuring that we don't get to a situation where things go wrong, which is engaging uh, the communities and the stakeholders at the beginning of the process to ensure that the rules of the game uh, and that the game itself is clear to everyone and once you shine a light on this at the beginning, uh, it really does reduce the, the incentives to then you know, not do things properly uh, in the future. And I think in the public sector, in the ODA space, because of the structures and because of, uh, of what we do, that is, it's, as I say, it's, it's built into the DNA. Do we get it right all the time? No, because I, I don't think it's possible to get it right all the time, but you know, that's that's what we're focused on. I think it's more challenging in the private sector, of course. Uh, and there, I think this is this issue about uh, transparency, independent monitoring, to bring in that piece that on the ODA side is just built into the way that the money flows. Um, so I didn't answer the question necessarily directly, uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not a specialist on, on the charge of human rights, et cetera, and, and how that applies to these uh, different instruments. Thank you, Mark, and thank you again for, for Bart, uh, to Bart, Mark, and, um, and Brice. Um, again, we've run out of time for this session, but I would really like to invite the three of you to join us uh, in the Q&A section and, um, and answer some of the questions that are still there for all of you um, directly in writing. That would be really great. There are some excellent questions there, simply not enough time to, to read them all out um, now. I'll pass on to Michelle for the final um, session. Oui, merci, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Uh, prior to uh, starting with the uh, last uh, panel, 
Uh, I wanted to show you a poll, and there are two questions, and I, I would like you to uh, answer them. As we didn't have any break, we didn't put that. But before uh, starting with panel four, could you actually put the questions on the screen so that everybody sees them? So here you have two questions. Uh, you have to answer with yes or no. The first one. Uh, Oui. Et la deuxième question, allez-y. Donc, euh, vous avez quelques minutes, mais je vous encourage à répondre à ce sondage. You have a few minutes, but I uh, would like you to answer this poll as quickly as possible. So, uh, at the end of panel four, we will have the answers to that. So, please take 30 seconds to answer. So, now we're going to move on how can the EU uh, prevent... Uh, to the taking of land and uh, everything based on the nature. Uh, so it's correct, connected to the solutions. I'm very happy to welcome Karim, uh, who is in charge of the, of the biodiversity unit, uh, the general direction, a part of the EU. Then we have somebody who is advisor of a program for funds for the UNPD, and then we have another speaker who is going to speak in the name of the investment on bank. So we have institutions and people who work in those institutions, but work on solution, on nature-based solution. So Karim and Berger, what, what does the EU do? Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam Rivasi. Um, webinar. I have listened with great interest to this very interesting presentation and exchanges on this. What I find is a highly important and very timely topic. We share most of these concerns that have been voiced about misguided use of offsets, not respecting indigenous and local people rights, destruction of nature, in particular, as you can imagine, as a policy officer in the biodiversity unit, we really try to work hard in order to bend this curve of biodiversity loss. However, I do not share all the issues I have heard, notably when we started saying that nature-based solutions is a fluffy new concept. I, I Please allow me this parenthesis to disagree with that, as nature-based solutions really have been used a long, long time already in research and also in on the ground, just perhaps using other terms and other names. I have during the time of this seminar, and I hope you probably capture the chat one way or another, just shared several uh, links where you find really comprehensive information on nature-based solutions. The European Union over the last decade even has invested, I mean, over 200 million of euros in nature-based solutions. There has been recently a publication of a handbook on the evaluation of nature-based solutions in the different sectors. I mean, all this is not perfect, but certainly we really, it's known what nature-based solutions are. And nature-based solutions, and uh, another term used in the, in, the, in the frame of the Convention of Biological Diversity, it said ecosystem-based approaches. And I mean, it's uh, they all share the same rationale. It's working with nature for people. It's based on the idea that you have healthy ecosystems and healthy ecosystems deliver the multiple benefits that we need for our societies and economies. I just needed to say that because I think 
we should not um, say that this is a new concept. I mean, it's got its really rise when in the Climate Action Summit in 2019, we had this dedicated work stream on nature-based solutions and the nature-based solutions manifesto. This truly triggered really attention and also investment. And I mean, it was shown that these nature-based solutions actually would have the potential, I mean, for having a third, over a third of the uh, overall mitigation potential needed to achieve the Paris Agreement that is also with one of the key messages of the IPES um, Global Assessment on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. But this, of course, means nature-based solutions which are beneficial for biodiversity. And when we speak about these definitions that are currently in use, be it, I mean, the IUCN definition was adopted in a resolution in 2016, the EU has, through its work of the DG research, elaborated on a definition that is referred to in the biodiversity and the adaptation strategies. And they all converge on this, that nature-based solutions bring multiple benefits for nature and people and climate, and they need to respect environmental and social safeguards. So um, considering this, we say nature-based solutions can be most effective when they are planned for longevity and not narrowly focused on rapid carbon sequestration. That's also confirmed by the recent IPES, IPCC expert workshop report that was published, I think, in June. And I've put in the link and I really do um, encourage you to have a look at it. This is not just a technical expert workshop by some experts, but it is has been a deliverable that was requested during IPES 7. And the authors of this report are nobody else but co-chairs and co-lead authors of former IPES and IPCC assessments. So I think it's fair to say that here we have kind of this state of the art knowledge where in this space of biodiversity, of the biodiversity loss and climate change nexus and nature-based solutions are very prominently referred to in this report. And it's also very openly and very uh, distinctly said what is what are their benefits and where are their limits and what are the risks and what are the uh, rules we need to respect in order to really um, benefit and harness, harness the multiple benefits these uh, approaches can deliver. It's also made clear that they can only be effective with ambitious reductions in all human caused greenhouse gas emissions. So it's absolutely clear that this cannot offset uh, technological carbon emissions. If ever offsetting comes into play, it needs to be even more. It's very clear that climate change and biodiversity loss as being interdependent emergencies. So we need to address both in an integrated manner. We cannot offset one with the other. That's not possible and that would lead to failure on both probably. Considering what I've just said, these examples you, you brought for, for land grabbing and human rights violations, I would say they are not linked to nature-based solutions, but they are linked to measures which intentionally or non-intentionally are actually misusing the concept. They sell nature-based solutions, but I think it was also one of the questions in the chat. Rather than uh, penalizing the concept, which really is a solid concept, we should really make sure that nature-based solutions, that we are clear what we are talking about when we talk about nature-based solutions, that we also clearly identify what are not nature-based solutions. For example, under these current definitions, monoculture plantations are definitely not nature-based solutions. They are monoculture plantations, but not nature-based solutions. This nature-based solutions concept is based on the scientific understanding of the interconnectedness between nature and people, something that has been also evoked by several speakers before me. And it prizes biodiversity and functioning ecosystems and their services, and these are supporting services, regulating services, provision, provisioning and cultural services within the land and seascape. So it's a very holistic umbrella approach. And this means clearly that management that goes contrary to biodiversity and natural processes, such as monocultures or intensive farming, is not considered an ecosystem-based ecosystem approach and thus does not qualify as sound effective nature-based solutions. I think that should always be at the back of our minds when we discuss nature-based solutions. 
Now, what we are missing right now, and that's also why there is controversy and why there are really um, quite contrasting and also conflicting discussions in in international negotiations, notably also in the current ongoing negotiations for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, is that indeed at the very moment, we do not have an internationally agreed definition. And so we really have to work to this and make sure that this internationally agreed definition reflects what I've, what I've said before, what is used in these um, current definitions, PDP that developed by IOCN or by the European Union. I have said that nature-based solutions are also known as ecosystem-based approaches, and that's the term that the Convention on Biological Diversity has used in its work on biodiversity and climate change over more than a decade. And lastly, at the CBD COP14 in 2018, the parties adopted guidelines for ecosystem-based approaches, and in these guidelines you will find principles and safeguards for nature-based solutions. And these approaches, they aim to manage land, water, sea, and living resources in a way that promotes conservation and sustainable use in a holistic and equitable way. And now, conventional biological diversity is a nearly universal treaty. It's, I think, US and Holy See, and maybe one more country in the world that is not party to the CBD. So we should respect the safeguards and principles that parties have adopted. I've, I think I've put a link to these guidelines also in the chat. These principles and safeguards, they are social and environmental measures to avoid unintended consequences of ecosystem-based approaches on for people and on biodiversity. So they also facilitate transparency, transparency throughout all stages of planning and implementation and promote the, re, the reallocation of benefits. This also means that monoculture plantations, I've already said it, or activities that are going against human rights are not nature-based solutions. Some of these principles, I mean, I don't want to go through all of them, just to those which are very relevant to this current workshop. So the principles for ensuring inclusivity and equity in planning and implementation, that's an overarching principle for the implementation of ecosystem-based approaches, and such as also a, a safeguard principle for nature-based solutions. A safeguard includes the promotion of full, effective and inclusive part participation of indigenous and local people, fair and equitable access to the benefits, transparent governance and access to information, and respecting rights of women and men from indigenous peoples and local communities. I've just quoted the headings because I do not want to lead to read it out uh, the, the whole text, but I really, really recommend the people who listen to this seminar to have a look at these safeguards and principles and then consider this is what parties have agreed to apply when they implement these approaches. So this is what parties have agreed, governance have agreed to apply when they implement nature-based solutions. So coming to my initial question, what actually the EU could do, and so this is not something what only the EU, but actually you and all the parties to the convention should do, is to make sure that these safeguards and principles are duly respected. And I mean, EU really is, I mean, through its European Green Deal and its related strategies is really where um, I think the, the protection and restoration, the sustainable use of biodiversity, the mainstream of biodiversity is really at heart and center of this endeavor of the European Green Deal. So if I could actually cut my intervention very short. We need to uh, put our money where our mouth is, but also put our actions where our mouth is, where we, we need to make sure that these strategies and principles and safeguards are not only adopted, but they're also duly implemented. And I would like to stop at that and um, see on the question that you may have. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Merci, merci, uh, Karine Zonberger. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Karine Zonberger. I can see that you defend biodiversity because you have a very nice painting behind you showing that you defend uh, at least uh, fauna.
Uh, thank you uh, for recording the principles. Now I'm going to give the floor to uh, Therese and Eddie on the program of small um, grants uh, on uh, PNUD programs. The floor is yours, Terence. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michel Rivasi, for your friend. Uh, invitation solution, uh, nature based solution. Hard after three and a half hours of uh, ideas and presentations to come up with anything which hasn't been said, but I will try to do my best to uh, walk you through some of the perspectives from UNDP and the small grants program. So um, we heard uh, from Caddy and how important the uh, 2019 uh, IPBES global assessment report was in terms of um, some of the major ideas coming out around the long-term perspectives for um, biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, the principle that um, the trajectory of land sharing, that meaning that, that human beings can actually coexist with biodiversity within um, heterogeneous landscapes is something that was um, uh, emphasized a lot in the, in the IPBES report. Um, last year, the following year, the UNDP launched the Human Development Report on the uh, Anthropocene. Uh, this looks at the geological age that we have entered where human beings are a driving force geologically. But in terms of the discussion today, I think what is important to emphasize is that um, this report recognizes that uh, nature-based solutions um, are still under uh, definition. But uh, the challenge is really around developing new metrics, as well as uh, modes of governance to uh, ensure that these, um, uh, these actions and these uh, solutions are uh, implemented in a sound and just and fair and equitable way, um, which includes the policy coherence point, which numerous speakers have made, including uh, Joanne uh, Carling. So um, we are this the level of urgency is, is increasing. Um, we, we heard just uh, last Friday how the UN Human Rights Council have uh, just approved the um, U, uh, human right uh, for a healthy environment on the 8th of October, spearheaded by a group of governments with the support of the uh, special rapporteur on the left, you see. And then just yesterday, the uh, letter from 125 uh, uh, NGOs and, and other concerned groups are calling for uh, the human rights perspective to be fully integrated into the post-2020 uh, CBD uh, global biodiversity framework, um, which is, of course, being discussed in, uh, in Kunming this week. So we heard from other speakers also about the um, topic of greenwashing and the um, uh, uh, sudden increase of, of interest from markets, regulators, pension funds, asset owners um, on sustainable finance um, and the, the two twin frameworks on the, the task force on, on climate uh, related financial disclosure and the one on, on nature. What I think uh, some of the uh, actors in this space are saying is that these two need to come together more coherently and to synergize um, because there is a, 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 a driving interest for uh, the three uh, ESG uh, metrics um, for uh, the investment world. I think uh, some commentators are noting that more is happening on the E in terms of, of, of climate and carbon um, biodiversity one and, and can say water and maybe um, the S and the G are still uh, catching up. But today's discussion is, is I guess, um, putting the emphasis on those other uh, two uh, uh, key dimensions of the ESG uh, frameworks. Now from the UNDP side, um, safeguards and compliance is something that has um, been uh, 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 a work in progress for the last 10 years. Um, the, the key principle of do no harm is reflected in the three levels of the SES from the principles to the project uh, and to the uh, screening tools and procedures. Um, some more information is there on the screen for each one of those, um, which uh, we don't have time to go into. Uh, the uh, focus of this panel is on the EU taxonomy. Um, 
uh, I was reading this and the reference from 2021 is to do no significant harm. I think this question of what is significant harm and what are the trade-offs um, in that uh, document around uh, whether the trade-off on climate change mitigation and adaptation, how that will balance with other uh, dimensions in terms of uh, biodiversity and, and so on. Um, uh, and, and human rights. Uh, the UNDP report on the Anthropocene uh, looks at three pillars in terms of uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, uh, biodiversity benefit and human well-being um, with an adjusted index for the human development index uh, uh, going forward. Now, just to go back to one of the early earlier webinars, Michelle, you organized on, um, on the uh, question of, of uh, uh, colonialism vert, so the green colonialism. I think uh, the uh, idea of protected and conserved areas is really uh, has changed a great deal since uh, 1872. Um, for the first 40 years, the US government didn't even have a national park service. It was still an idea. Um, and uh, what we're seeing now in the uh, context of the CBD is, 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 I would say very few projects are ever built on a, a notion of fortress conservation. Sometimes the implementation and the application is, is different. Um, and so I would uh, challenge some of the, uh, uh, the authors that are, uh, are suggesting that uh, protected areas are just about uh, fortress conservation. We're seeing a increased recognition of different forms of governance. And you see on the right, two reports that were launched uh, this year, uh, 2021 on uh, governance type D for protected and conserved areas, uh, ICCAs. We've heard from Joseph Itongwa, uh, my, my brother from uh, DR Congo, about uh, his work there, as well as um, another report uh, which was prepared uh, by uh, 12 different organizations with uh, WWF, UNEP, uh, World Conservation Monitoring Center. And here you see uh, an analysis of the, the global lands um, overlaid to the lands of IPLCs and the proportion of those lands in good ecological conditions. So from the graph on the left, you see that um, obviously the, 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 what we're discussing today is of paramount importance to recognize uh, these lands. Alain Frechette gave us um, a lot of uh, detailed information about this. Um, I would add on the right, you see some of the uh, situations of overlap. So historically protected areas have overlapped uh, with IPLC lands, and, and, and this is something which requires attention as well in terms of, uh, of governance uh, processes. I have two more slides. So we've heard a lot about the IUCN standard. This is continuing to evolve. There is an element on inclusive governance. What uh, may be missing, I think, um, and we heard from uh, our indigenous brothers and sisters about the importance of culture and values, um, uh, not just economic values, but other spiritual and, and cultural values. Um, and I think um, another UN agency not here today, UNESCO has uh, been advocating a lot for the role of culture um, in the uh, 2030 SDG agenda. I would add, uh, since I work with the Global Environment Facility, GEF, that GEF is also looking at the role of um, behavior, norms, values uh, uh, for the next Jeff uh, 8 replenishment starting in 2022. And I'll finish with this uh, slide, which uh, comes from uh, uh, what you see there are two of the um, AVAZ um, campaign organization documents submitted for the G20 and for the IUCN 2021 Congress, which just happened last month in September. Um, where they note that this uh, possibility for increased uh, direct uh, access, increased flow of EU development finance for IPLCs is something which uh, it, it exists. Um, and uh, where I work, and I haven't talked about the small grants program, but uh, we fund um, civil society NGO initiatives in uh, approximately 130 countries and have done for the last 30 years channeling support uh, to uh, action to support uh, indigenous peoples and local uh, communities. And um, I would just conclude by saying that 
the, the figure we heard from Rainforest UK that only 0.1% of uh, finance for uh, climate change action is two IPLCs. Um, and if this could be increased to even 1%, that would be a very uh, massive uh, opportunity to um, channel the support uh, to the uh, actors on the ground that uh, need it most to ensure that the nature-based solutions are, are fair, equitable, and just. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terence, for uh, this. Um, you summarized all the report. Thank you for your intervention. I'm going to give the floor to Eva Mayerofor, who is uh, a specialist in biodiversity and environment for the investment for the Investment World Bank. So, how does that bank select its choices? Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you. Michel, thank you for the invitation, and I'm going to move to English. Large scale land acquisitions have increased in scale, pace, uh, due to uh, turning nature into a commodity and environment and climate objectives and strategies of, for example, financial institutions such as the EIB. The areas most affected are, of course, the global commons that we've heard that today, uh, lands that local, traditional and indigenous peoples and communities traditionally use collectively, including much of the world's forest, wetlands and rangelands. In increasing number of cases, land acquisition occurs with the objective of implementing nature based solutions to achieve our climate and environment objectives. And this represents, as we have heard clearly, a major and growing threat, not just to local livelihoods and human rights, but also to conservation objectives. So tenure securing land rights offers a foundation for managing natural resources, uh, resource use sustainably in the ways that support long term conservation objectives while simultaneously promoting local resilience and sustainable livelihoods. Supporting rural communities to secure and scale up land rights can reduce the risk of land grabs and develop new opportunities for conservation. It can also help not only governments, but multilateral development banks like the EIB meet their climate and environmental targets in a way that supports rather than threatens local livelihoods and their rights. Institutions such as the EIB and its MDB peers are realizing this and increasingly are forming stronger partnerships with local land users and working with them to secure land tenure and conservation goals through initiatives such as conservancies, indigenous and community conserved areas, and community-based forestry and pasture management. But often institutions uh, like the uh, EIB often see the complexity of debates around land rights use and their variability from country to country as a barrier to using land rights to achieve conservation aims. Land conflicts are often deeply rooted in governance failures, an area that is often both unfamiliar and uncomfortable territory for international organizations, particularly those that work closely with state agencies and governments. So community owned and managed conservancies present an opportunity for the intersection of development, climate goals and biodiversity conservation. Processes of integrated and participatory land use planning are required to fully consider at national and local level the most appropriate use of lands, taking into consideration the full range of political, economic, social and environmental factors. A very good example of this is found in Kenya with the Northern Rangeland Trust, which is a membership organization owned and led by 39 community conservancies. It serves in northern and coastal Kenya. Here we have a secure land tenure policy framework mm. that supports the pursuance yeah. of sustainable economic and land use practices that are in tune with people's sociocultural systems and would go a long way towards sustaining livelihoods, promoting biodiversity conservation and reducing poverty and landlessness in rangelands. And this is a great opportunity which the EIB has been working uh, with uh, those conservancies. New partnerships with human rights based organizations with development and with development organizations, both local and international that take a rights based approach could offer a route to achieving shared goals. The global land crisis and the need to strengthen land rights in order to address shared human rights and conservation goals at the landscape level could catalyze stronger uh, collaboration between environment and development organizations. But what does it require? It requires better integration of land use planning at national and local levels and needs to be carried out to guide rational and better informed decisions about land allocation and use. 
This land use planning will require the involvement of many different actors, including local and land users and conservationists and the collection of different types of information. And information is quite difficult to acquire. Though the process is resource intensive and requires time, the outcome is likely to be more sustainable, productive and conflict free land use and agreements between different land users and right owners will be established. However, any lengthy process tends to uh, put uh, development uh, types of projects uh, also, um, meaning that organizations such as the EIB and private sector um, uh, players will kind of balk at the, the length of these processes. International safeguard standards and or mechanisms need to be revisited and made fit for purpose, explicitly spelling out the requirements for rights-based approach to biodiversity and cross-referencing to the standards on indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant peoples and local communities and vulnerable groups. So with the revision of the EIB standard on biodiversity, we have tried to uh, strengthen the rights-based approach to biodiversity and hopefully have addressed some of the concerns that were spelt out today. Under the EU taxonomy, the application of the um, of the minimum social safeguards have not been spelt out as yet. And this would be an opportune moment to ensure that the rights of indigenous peoples and traditional communities are respected and not infringed upon. Governments and private sector um, have uh, had, uh, require guidance uh, for multi-stakeholder approaches to meaningful engagement. And for example, EIB has worked in 2020, uh, 2019 uh, with, um, with the Arctic Council on a guidance on I, uh, indigenous peoples and local community participation in EIA in the European Arctic, which listening to all of you would probably need to be updated. We need to pay more attention to the different models for community conservation with the aim of achieving a full understanding of what works best in different contexts and to what degree these models achieve goals of both conservation and development and protecting the rights of indigenous peoples and communities, as well as the life of human and environmental defenders. Unfortunately, as Bryce uh, clearly said, it is very difficult to do and not always obvious when you're sitting in Luxembourg or Washington DC. Over the past decade, less than 1% of global climate ODA, as Terence mentioned, went to indigenous peoples and local communities, tenure and forest management. And just over one tenth of that was directed to securing land tenure rights, averaging about $30 million uh, a year in the last 10 years. However, our financial architecture is completely inadequate to mobilize and allocate the resources necessary to achieve global climate conservation and development goals. And in order to achieve these goals, we as multilateral development banks need to significantly increase our funding to support the collective land rights agenda simplify administrative requirements of existing institutions such as our requirements and align to rights holders initiatives so allowing a better access to finance from these rights holders develop also new finance mechanisms with rights holders together with them to attract funding and channel resources directly to local conservancies such as for the northern rangeland trust as what we are trying to do uh, with them and increase that coordination among public and private philanthropies, financial mechanism, rights holders and other allies. This financing should then be transparent and adequately reported on using well-defined metrics and standards. Maybe the amendment of the EU Aarhus regulation, um, which is applicable to EU institutions such as the EIB, could hold us accountable to this. So I just want to uh, finish off that as the primary steward of most of areas of high biodiversity, the essential role of indigenous peoples and local communities in managing terrestrial greenhouse gas sinks and biodiversity reservoirs need to be globally recognized, promoted and supported. In fact, all we need is to acknowledge that collective tenure rights is cost effective climate conservation and development solution. I will stop here and hand over back to Michelle. Merci, Eva. Thank you, thank you, Eva. I can see that there is uh, in motivation when it comes to f helping the indigenous people. I will now give the floor to Helena to moderate the question and answer session. 
Thank you, Michel, and thank you to the speakers in the last uh, panel. Before I submit uh, the questions to the panelists, I was asked to show the results of the survey we did earlier. Because I don't have access to that slide. Uh, maybe yeah. someone from the technical team. Just give it a second. Or, or maybe I should start with the questions and when that slide is, is ready to be shared, uh, we can discuss it. Um, so going into um, some of the questions in the Q&A, there is, uh, I think, one question for all the um, panelists on the last panel. Uh, question pour l'ensemble des intervenants. Comment okay. concilier, uh, for all the speakers, how would you consider nature-based solutions and the NDCs? How can we give a value to the institution and the structure on that NBS when those are often overlooked? It's quite a broad question, not just for the last speakers, but I would like to invite you to give your contribution on that. I believe this, this issue around the NDCs is quite an interesting one with such an angle with that connection with the NBS. So maybe we could ask Karine and then Terence and then Eva to share some elements on that particular point. It's the national determined contributions, right? Correct? Yeah. Yes, correct. That's the <laughs> That's Finnish good. translation, yes, all the acronyms. Yeah, 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 I don't know. I mean, there's one thing that it is fortunately we see that actually the inclusion of nature-based solutions, I mean, we see this as positive development, has actually increased. I mean, there's more and more nature-based solutions included in these national determined contributions, a lot of them for contribution to adaptation. And the good news is that each of these measures, nature-based solutions for adaptation, they also contribute to mitigation, even though it might not enter into the um, carbon measurements. But I mean, as the plants for photosynthesis, they capture carbon, so it all contributes. So the more nature-based solutions we implement, the more, multiple benefits we can harness and in this context i can also see what i've heard right this morning during the world leader summit for the first session of the cop 15 part one that started yesterday the french president macron he had made actually a, a big announcement that 30 percent of the french climate funding would be directed to nature to biodiversity the more so it is important that we get right what nature-based solutions are because the investment streams also through the national determined contributions they are bound to increase so we really need to get this right thank you I thank you, Helena. I have two points to highlight. The first one is uh, the support that we have uh, with uh, 120 countries towards NDCs and like you said the role of indigenous people and local communities is not highlighted enough. I believe it's ongoing work and we need to go further in order to stress out how important that is. The second point is the point when we have engaged with the indigenous people, with the the climate fund for climate, the green climate fund and the needs uh, at political level for indigenous people, which was approved in 2018. I believe the next step is the access to the funding for indigenous people to access that fund. Um, I don't deal with the NDCs. Um, that is, my, my, those are my uh, climate colleagues, but I indeed, I mean, um, we are, do, we are seeing a, a, an inclusion of uh, nature-based solutions uh, in, in most of the uh, adaptation uh, strategies, as well as uh, uh, with the link, of course, to the NDCs. We do support governments um, in meeting their, their NDCs uh, through uh, making sure that they are Paris-aligned. 
um, but the link to uh, Indigenous people is not there. And I think this is a, a, an opportunity at uh, COP26. I think that there's that realization uh, that the link needs to be uh, to be there, um, and that without uh, the support of Indigenous uh, peoples and, and traditional communities, we will not be reaching uh, our our NDCs. So um, yes, uh, but I think uh, the climate colleagues are only coming uh, around to it now. Um, and that hasn't been on their radar to, uh, to date. Thank you very much uh, to, to all three of you. And um, I just want to now take us back to the poll. Um, I believe that the results are ready to be shared. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to caveat these results because uh, it seems that the participation rate was rather low. Uh, so this is maybe something for us to, to learn from in terms of uh, improving on the tool for, for the next uh, next time that we get together uh, or next time that such an event takes place to ensure that um, we can uh, maybe motivate more to participate in, uh, in the poll. But having said that, um, on the first question, maybe the, the answers is a little bit, um, well, a, a little bit sort of half and half, but uh, uh, maybe something that's, uh, at least for me, is a bit surprising, but uh, would be interesting to sort of unpack if we had the time. Um, but in terms of um, <laughs> in terms of the second question, I think uh, there there is no um, there's no uncertainty. Um, the majority of uh, respondents. Uh, clearly answered yes, and, and therefore maybe we could ask a question to um, Karen um, in terms of um, would you be, I mean, are you able to say if there are uh, mandatory guidelines uh, or mandatory guidelines can be expected soon uh, at EU legislation level? Well, thank you. And actually, I have to admit, seeing this uh, outcome, I mean, I'm very frank, I'm a bit astonished that we ask you for. EU de developing these mandatory guidelines. I mean, I think when we look globally, I mean, the, um, the big majority of, of indigenous, and local com indigenous and local communities are really not inside EU. I mean, I just come from my experience from the negotiations under the Convention of Biological Diversity, that we have the Article J negotiations, and here, for the EU, it's then member states where with indigenous local, local communities groups, but this is inside EU, not the majority. I'm not saying that it's not there, it's not important, absolutely not, but I mean, compared to outside, outside it's even much more important. So again, I'm saying the, I mean, these uh, rules and, and principles and safeguards and all this, if you go through, because under the Convention for Biological Diversity, it has been a very important issue since its inception in 1993. It also has this specific article for indigenous peoples and local communities. And also you can see that they have actually, um, during negotiations, quite a loud voice. And if you look at the at um, in, loud and important. And if you look at the outcome, I mean, I think it's quite prominent, a lot more prominent indeed than if you look in uh, our colleagues from the climate convention. So I completely agree with a colleague from the European Investment Bank, Eva, that it's really there they are starting. But again, they should not start from scratch, but rather use what's out there. So cut a long story short, I personally, but this is really now more a, a personal reaction to this up question. I have, I cannot investigate further just like this, but I don't see there's space for an EU, on an EU mandatory level. I don't think so. It's really, it's embedded in our role as party to the international convention. But I may be wrong. But uh, like this, I have to admit the outcome of your poll like, come, comes as a surprise because for me, this is really an overarching um, responsibility. And EU is being front runner spearhead in many, many issues. But here, I think we are already very much involved through the international negotiations. But again, I'm not excluding it. If I may rather can also make a bit of a reflection on the outcome of the first poll there. I was quite surprised to see it so close. I mean, that's also a lesson, but as you say, not so many people have 
have contributed, so it might be not so so indicative. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm just again. I'm going to say the same thing. Mindful of the time, there are uh, more questions in the in the Q and A section. There's one question that someone has posted many times about uh, les incitations suffisantes, les places de la loi pour accéder au fonds. Évidemment, c'est une question. Incentives in terms of accessing the fund. It's uh, all those issues related to governance and the right and so on. Ask maybe. Karen, Eva, and Terence, if they would be willing to go and answer in writing uh, to a couple more questions that are in the Q&A. And I will hand over back to Michel for, um, for the conclusion, um, as this has been a very uh, long and rich exchange. Uh, I know there are many more questions and comments that the audience would like us to, to sort of reflect on. Uh, but of course, the nature of these events mean that there's, a, there's often limited time. Um, thank you again. Merci, Hélène, d'avoir participé à ces thank questions. Thank you, Helena, for participating in those sessions of questions and answers. But before that, I would like to see if Marc Tarabella is with us because he was to be involved with me in delivering those concluding remarks. Marc, are you here? Marco, you can, yeah. D'accord. Marco, alors. Mesdames et messieurs, vraiment désolé de ne pas pouvoir Ladies être ici. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really sorry, I'm not able to attend you in terms of NBS and the options are limited. And if it means it's a status quo, Business in general has already existed around the la nature, ecosystem, the so the separation of the culture, the, the peuples, human rights, including the rights for indigenous people who doesn't take, it to, doesn't take the culture into account, the uh, customary practices and the knowledge of community level local communities. Furthermore, the definition of a narrow meaning of NBS can lead to some communities to be in a Way, put aside. I would like to thank again Michel Rivasi and NGOs as well as Transparency International for convening such an event. That kind of conference or incitating the EU and international organizations to consider key issues. So what kind of issues are we trying to solve so when we talk about NBS? What are the concrete effects of such processes on territories and the way of life of indigenous people? and how we perceive that the approaches solutions have to go via respect, what must be based on respect of rights and, uh, and such an approach could lead to positive uh, results if it was done with uh, uh, informed and free consent and, the, and local, local communities and indigenous people and all the rights are guaranteed and if it's done in order to strengthen the resilience of communities to climate change. The acknowledgement of those rights of indigenous people and local communities, the safety, land danger, for their territories and the implementation of such process would have to be a minimum requirement in order to apply that NBS approach in at community level and to have a full participation of them in that process. So the European Parliament has to ensure that they have the right support in that sense in particular, when it comes to defining international objectives, Green New Deal, and other aspects with the most vulnerable population. So that there are some solutions that exist already, and again, we don't want to reinvent them. Mesdames et Messieurs, vraiment désolé de ne pas pouvoir être physiquement avec vous aujourd'hui. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really sorry I'm not here with you today. Bon, eh bien, écoutez, euh, il a fait okay. un peu. OK. Well, il a donné des éléments clés. He shared some key elements, which I think are part of all debates. I would like to thank you all, uh, thank the technical team, which helped us 
host that webinar. It was quite diversified. There were a lot of speakers and what I draw out of it, my, my takeaway is first, we need to have a definition with a more precise frame than the definition I gave you at the very beginning. This was noted down by Karin Zandberger. Amongst other things, we need to have a very holistic vision. The uh, social environmental principles are to be included. We need transparency, human rights have to be protected, promoting the participation of local population. All those principles which have been shared has to be, have to be integrated in the meaning. My question I would uh, ask, is who is going to assess, evaluate all that? This was one of the very first questions we asked, as in we need to integrate the local population upstream. But I believe we need a real proper body, integration body, integrated body, so that we can ensure that the principles that we want to define and uh, build around have to be done in the most scientific way but also have to integrate some of the values uh, presented by Terence, by the UNDP with spiritual, cultural values with the promotion of uh, traditions also. Sorry, um, I've got my phone ringing. It's going to stop, hopefully. So that's an important aspect. Now, what can Europe do? What can Europe do? I would say at Europe level, we have what we call due diligence, which will ensure, and the representative of Nestle mentioned that earlier, we have due diligence that will force the companies to adopt responsible behaviors. And this is very important because all the links in that chain will have a form of responsibility when it comes to corporate and social response and environmental responsibilities. I would like to insist that what I noted in our exchanges is that biodiversity is today an, an, a very important element, just like climate, because they, have, they go both hands in hand. And we have now integrated indigenous people. And I can assure you, a few years ago, the IP were put aside. We did talk about them, but not quite as much as we do today. And that's the result of a report which has demonstrated that indigenous people and local communities were part of biodiversity and themselves were doing what was necessary in order to conserve and preserve all those ecosystems. And that's a very important aspect. What I take away from the session, I believe Joseph talked about it, we will have to highlight and give more value to traditional knowledge from the indigenous people as it would ensure the protection of youngst youngsters and the youth by giving value to those uh, traditional knowledge will then give a possibility for the youth to see a good value of their roots and where, where they come from, the roots. And I believe we will have to see maybe with the support of the EU, implement or design a program where such no, uh, traditional knowledge could be uh, put in value, could be highlighted. It was also meant, asked for an independent uh, body for the monitoring of all the phones, i.e. how those phones are being used or being spent, are they being given to also to indigenous people and how indigenous people themselves can use and have access to climate phones. I believe these are leads, work, work leads, and it is it, just shouldn't, it can't just be words, it has to translate into actions. And final point, we have had a lot of events 
on indigenous people. And I can tell you if there is any, any kind of emergency situation anywhere in the world, I have an assistant who can uh, take all those alerts, all those see those uh, emergency situations to assist you. I'm not saying we'll have a miracle solution for all the problems, but when I see the environmental defenders or real whistleblowers who are taking huge risks and risk their lives because they highlighted and they uh, told us about this functioning in some ecosystem where they live, I believe we must make sure to defend them and maybe that at the EU Parliament level, we will create a cell which uh, which will be here to help in such emergency situation. A big thank you to all speakers. Thank you for facilitating all those conversations. And you can see that together uh, in relation to what will happen at COP25 and COP26 in Glasgow, that we must unite our forces is in order to have a holistic vision, but more than that, to have tools so that we can perform and really assist effectively the indigenous people and develop biodiversity in the protected areas with that non-fortress vision as it used to be. But that biodiversity is to be everywhere, both at in protected level, protected areas levels, but also in areas which are not protected because we cannot live without all those ecosystems which are part of life and we belong to that ecosystem. Thank you, everybody. And thank you also to the NGOs who have helped me participate and uh, organize that event. Thank you very much also from FERN and from Transparency International. I believe you're still here. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, FERN. Thank you at uh, thank you and Transparency International and also to DOSIP. And thank you very much also on behalf of Transparency International. We had very rich uh, conversation, a lot of takeaways and uh, Michelle's and your office all doing a very interesting work in, in activism. Activis, activism. And we do appreciate those exchanges and that partnership. Thank you, everybody. Merci. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Karine. So, uh, Mariali, just a couple, uh, just a couple of points. We're going to clear all the attendees and then pretty much wrap up the session as well. Uh, on Facebook, the live stream has stopped, so that's all already up on Facebook. The event itself. Outside of that, uh, I'll have the questions and answers ready for you in about 15 to 20 minutes as well in an email. As for the videos, that's going to be probably sometime tomorrow as it's a bit of a longer upload. Donc, la session Facebook est terminée et sera disponible très prochainement. ainsi que les questions qui seront capturées.